the breath is is a way to handle yourself emotionally and physically. Um, like I said, it's just as important as sleeping. It's just as important as exercise, as diet. If you have if you have poor breathing, then you're not going to feel as good. You're not going to sleep as well. You're not going to eat as well. You're not going to digest as well. All these things because the breath directly affects your nervous system, and your nervous system is responsible for all those things. With the philosophy yoga, it's this this mind body connection thing. It's it's not that the mind, the body, the breath, the spirit are different, but it's they're they're all the same. My distractions or whatever else is coming up in my mind, I sit down and I close my eyes and I focus on my breath. And then as things come up, whatever, I, I recognize that they come up. So I, I count, inhale, one, exhale, inhale, two, exhale. You, you justify everything. Every, every action that we do, we justify. That's not just, justifying is not a bad thing, but it's, it can be. It, it, it could be bad as, as is when you hurt people or you do bad things and you justify them as being good. Suffering's a choice that we choose to be in that pain. And I was definitely choosing to be in that pain, just, of just not being happy. Welcome everyone to another episode. I'm here today with my special guest, Mr. Dylan Werner. He is a world-renowned yoga teacher and hand balancer. And we're gonna get into a lot of interesting topics today about meditation, breath work, and yoga, and just movement in general, right? And how that affects you as a person and you know your story is you know you started as a marine and now you're a world-renowned yoga teacher so we're just going to talk about like your journey and how that's evolved and like looking back at what you've achieved how it's shaped who you are now so yeah thank you for coming on thanks for having me yeah so um i want to start with with, with yoga of course so you know yoga is an interesting topic to me because I used to date a girl, um, she was a yogi, and I, I can count over the seven years I was with her, how many times I went to do yoga. And I was just like, I never really had that appeal for yoga. She, she so, really sold it for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I just never really had that appeal for it. So I'm curious about when you first tried yoga, was it, was it love at first sight? This is a really interesting topic, especially coming from a man, a masculine man, you know, yeah. somebody that you, you're athletic, you're in a lot of different sports and I know you do jujitsu and mm -hmm. probably some other stuff. Uh, yeah. Like I didn't come into yoga. Like the appeal wasn't really, wasn't that I started with yoga through martial arts, uh, but also being from California, yoga is a pretty big thing there and it always has been. And it's a bit more masculine or not, not necessarily as yoga being masculine or feminine, but it's not considered emasculine to do yoga. Uh, it's just like kind of a normal thing that people do to be healthy and stuff. So, uh, and, and the other thing with yoga too, is there's so many different types and styles of yoga. There's as many different types of yoga as there are yoga teachers. And so if you go to a yoga teacher that is really soft and easy and, and into more into like flexibility and, and that's going to appeal to somebody, uh, then, and if that's not your style, then you're not going to be attracted to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Or if you go to like my class, which is a quite a bit more challenging, uh, it's not necessarily I would say centered on just the physical, but it is definitely very physically demanding. And if you're somebody that likes a physically demanding class, something that will challenge you, then you're going to be more attracted to that. So, uh, you know, it's like for me, I was, I was lucky that mar martial arts was kind of my first introduction into it. But then when I really started getting into yoga and, and more of a, of a like less taken from martial arts and more from like a yoga studio. I was introduced through power yoga, which was really hard. It was hot yoga. It was in, it was in a room. It kicked my ass. It made me sweat. And, uh, it just, it felt really good in the body. And it was, it was nice also because it came with this community factor. And I think that's really an important thing for anybody getting into anything and why people do most activities is because there is a community and, uh, um, surrounded you know that 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 either welcomes you or, or whatever and so if you feel like you fit into it you want to come back to that it's like mm -hmm. why we probably both work out nirvana like i'm, I'm actually someone that I, I like to train by myself yeah. i like to do my own thing and even when i go to to the gym that we both go to uh nirvana strength i still train by myself but i feel as though i'm part of a community mm -hmm. and so um 
yeah, that kind of, that kind of sucked me into it. I felt challenge. I felt community. It was something new. I was looking for something that I didn't know I was looking for. You know, it was, it was, I was going through this period in my life where something was missing. And I felt like at that point I had exhausted all options of what it, what I needed to be happy. I didn't feel, you know, I thought I was happy. You know, I, th I think a lot of people think that they're happy. If you ask them about their life, they, you ask, are you happy? They're like, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, unless you get like into some like more conscious people and then they'll be like, no, I'm not happy or whatever. Like they, they, they could actually see that suffering within them. Mm. Uh, and suffering a, is a pretty big word to unpack with that. You know, there's so many different degrees of suffering. I mean, you could just say to live is to suffer. Life mm. is pain. Mm -hmm. uh, it's how we've evolved, how we communicate, how we, how we stay safe is through knowing pain. And I guess you could go deeper than that and say suffering is a choice that we choose to be in that pain. And I was definitely choosing to be in that pain, just, just not being happy. I, I classic, classic not wanting what I had and, and wanting what I didn't have. And I didn't realize that. So I was constantly living in my future because I thought my future was better for me. And so I was searching for this and yoga, showed me a different perspective that I didn't have before. You know, I mean, and I, I say yoga, uh, yoga is, just, you know, it's a term. It's a term that we now use for as a system of poses and movements and shapes that we go through. But it, it is so much more than that. It's a philosophy. It's an ideology. It's a, um, yeah, it's a way to unpack the world to see how, you fit into it as not as like a piece of it or as a part of it, but as it. And I, I mean, like I've been doing this yoga thing for quite a while now. I mean, I've, I was first really introduced to it when I was 21. I'm 41 now. Wow, so that's quite, quite, yeah, yeah. quite a lot of years of practicing. But I would, I would say it's been the last 10 years. It took me about 10 years to get to that point of, of, of recognizing what this process was mm. and that's um it's really interesting what you said there because you know you started yoga when you've accomplished everything else in your life at that, at that point right like you you were a firefighter you had this image of success and you achieved everything you wanted to achieve and then you felt like something was missing even though you had achieved all the things that you thought would make you happy yeah that's the thing with goals goals are it's uh no matter what, they're, they're always going to be uh, not satisfying. There, there's, a, there's an interesting story, a Buddhist story, um, talks about these, these children that were, uh, I'll, I'll make it a little bit more modern, so that the, these children that were wishing for something, or, or they're, they're playing this game, it's called the wishing game. And, and the, the way it works is you get to wish, you get one wish, and, and you go around and decide, what, what do you want to wish for? And there's five children. Uh, and it was a particularly hot day. And the first child said, oh, I wish I, I, wish I had some ice cream. And, and then, the, you know, they all thought that was a good wish. And then the second, they always try to one up each other. So this, the second kid, he's like, well, I wish for an ice cream shop. And it was like, so I could have all the ice cream I want, not just one. It's like, wow. And then the, th the third kid goes, well, I wish for a billion dollars so I could, you know, I buy whatever I want, including ice cream and everything. And they're like, wow, that you, you know, you really picked the best wish there. And so then the, the fourth kid goes, well, I would use my wish for three wishes. And the first wish I would ask for an ice cream shop. The second wish I'd ask for a billion dollars. And the third wish I would use to ask for more wishes. And so I would have unlimited wishes and they all just thought he was a genius. Uh, and then the fifth kid, he goes, I would wish that I would be so content that I wouldn't want any wishes. Ooh. And it's like, you know, we, we think of, if we live our life in that way, if, if, if we live our life thinking that we need to pursue something, I need to, I need to get something to be happy or to fulfill myself. And, and, and like the, the, the fourth kid, actually, I would, I would say he was the worst off because like to say unlimited wishes, that's just a constant, 
a constant chase. And we think like, I don't know if, if you've ever thought about like, what would I do for wishes? Everyone's like, well, I'd want more wishes. You know, that's like the, the thing you wish for more wishes, mm -hmm. but it just puts you in that cycle. And that was my life. My life was a cycle of achieving things, these wishes that I, I wanted to go after when really I just wanted to be content with what I was, how I was, who I was. Uh, and to do that is not about it, obtaining anything. It's not about becoming anything. It's just about changing your perspective. Uh, our perspective is how we interpret, how we receive the world. You, know, you ever, you ever look at like, um, the, they have those games like where it has a picture, but it's so close up and, and like from a, a weird angle that you can't see what it is or you can't recognize what it is. And so what perspective does is it actually gives you information. It gives you intelligence. It gives you knowledge and, and not changing what is there, but changing you, you, if you don't have the right perspective, you can't even see what is there. And so oftentimes we have everything that we need, everything that we want, everything that will make us happy, but we don't have the right perspective to view it, to make us happy, you know, to, to understand that. And so that's like, I would say, as I've moved through this and I'd, I'd say I'm a happy person. Most of the time I have well more than what I need. Uh, it, but even if I had way less, it, it's not what I have. It's how I see what I have. Mm. Yeah. That's an interesting perspective because, um, I've heard this so many times, this kind of, uh, topic and you know, a lot of people say, well, it's, it's easy for you to say, cause you have everything you need, right? Like that's, a, that's like the, the knee jerk reaction from a lot of people when we, when we talk about this kind of stuff. So what, what would you say to that person? Because it's hard for them to see because they, they don't yet have everything they want. So they're of that opinion of that, those kids that they want more, wish, more wishes, right? Yeah. So they, it's not in their reality at that present moment to think of being content because they're just used to. Have you ever seen a billionaire that's content? Uh, I personally don't know any billionaires. I, I, I know, uh, yeah. I know one, actually uh -huh. know, personally know one billionaire, which yeah. is kind of a rare thing. Mm. Uh, but I mean, you don't need to know a billionaire to, to see, to see, I don't know. I don't, I, I guess it is a judgment or of, of anything, but you know, most billionaires are, are not content. They're going, they're trying to like, there's no amount of money that's going to be enough money. If you have a billion dollars and that's not enough, then what is, mm, true. you know, if you have a million dollars and that's not like there, there's the, uh, I saw this a long time ago, the, the, the truth and the lie, right? The, the big, the big truth and the big lie. And the, the truth is like, if you don't have, if you don't have shelter, like a home, you know, something, keep the rain off. If you don't have food, basic comforts, if you don't have community, loved ones, uh, if you don't have those things that you're probably going to be unhappy. And so as you get those things, you get them and they bring you happiness. Having, having a place to stay that you feel safe and comfortable in will make you happy. Having enough to be able to feed yourself and do the, and do the things that you want to do will make you happy. Uh, having friends and loved ones around you will make you happy. So that's, that's true. Mm. But having more of that will not make you more happy. Having a bigger house or having more money or having more friends or having more things to do isn't going to add to that happiness. But because we bought into the first one that, you know, this, I, I now have a warm place to sleep at night and food in my belly that made me happy. So I, I need to have more of that. Right. And, and that's where people get confused. And so you say like all the people that don't have everything that they have, they, they, could, they look at you go, well, you have everything. Well, I only say I have everything is because I view that I have everything. Mm. You know, that's, that goes back to that perspective. If I right. thought that, well, I need another million dollars in the bank or I need a bigger house or I need a better girlfriend or I need a, a whatever, you know, yeah. I'm going to go back in that place of, of wanting what I don't have, that it's the classic Buddhism attraction and aversion. Mm. You know, the Buddha said the root of all suffering is wanting what you don't have and not wanting what you do have. Mm. And you know, I, I truly believe in that. It's, it's a hard place to get to and it takes practice. But more, it's just mindfulness and perception. Like you got to remind yourself.
you got to remind yourself that going after this isn't going to make me more happy. There's, uh, I mean, th these are topics that I, I think I constantly talk over or talk, talk about all the time. Uh, like the idea of needing growth. Growth is, is something that we all pursue. Most people do. I don't know of anybody that doesn't pursue some sort of betterment, self, self betterment. But with that is the danger of thinking that it's a, it's a place that we're moving to. So in, in yoga, it's called tapas. Tapas is your, your inner desire. It's your fire, your passion. It's what makes you want to give the best to whatever it is that you're doing. Directly, this is in the niyamas. Uh, and so directly preceding that is what's called santosha. It's contentment. And that, that's, I, I, I really think there's some intelligence about putting contentment before tapas or, or before this desire to, to get more. Because if you're content with what you have, but yet you push yourself to growth, it's, it's, it's almost like this perfect thing. It's like you're always growing, but you're always happy with how that growth is going. Even if, like today, I went into the gym and I just, I felt weak because I didn't sleep very well last night for whatever reason. You know, it's just like sometimes you don't sleep good. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been pushing myself really hard uh, for not, I'm not working towards a single thing. I don't have like, I'm working one arm handstands like to get better at those. I'm, I'm working different kind of stuff, but it's not because like I'm, tr I'm striving to have those, those skills or to have bigger muscles or any of that. It's just that I like what it feels like to grow. And so as long as I, I don't confuse the need to be better and with giving my best, that I'm able to enjoy what that is. I'm, I'm able to enjoy that process without needing to look towards the future. And I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with these things. I can say with, with anything, like as, as a listener, like whatever, whatever you're listening to, whatever you, you take up, it's with philosophy, it's always like, what philosophy is useful for you? If a philosophy is useful for you, it adds value to your life. It makes you happier to live a better life or whatever. And, and that doesn't mean that all philosophies are going to work for you or work at the same time. Like sometimes things happen when they're appropriate. I remember the first time I came to Bali back in like 2012, 2011 or 2012, I was here and I, I went and I listened to uh, Guru, Guruji. Guruji is just like a term of endearment for any great teacher. But this was up in Ubud at the Banyan Tree and he was a, a monk that was up there. I remember listening to him teach non-dualism. And at that time, it was like I'd kind of heard of it, but I hadn't really understood it so much and especially as it's taught in the traditional manner it's a hard one to move into and the idea of non-dualism is that there's not two that's why it's non-dualism because to say something is one implies that there's two so if you say that there's not two it's saying that everything is not two everything is one essentially or everything is whole mm -hmm. as as we're all a part of this, this same thing. And it's a really hard concept. And I, I didn't understand it so much. I didn't necessarily like wa even want to believe it because I didn't think it was useful. Like how did this add value to my life? It wasn't until like years later that I started understanding how can I use this philosophy? I mean, we think, we think we're different because you and I have unique perspectives. You know, I see, I see you as you see me, but you don't see you and I don't see me. Right. Because I'm yeah. the one looking and you're the one looking. And so we see ourselves as as different, not even just different. We see ourselves as separate. We are obviously different. But in non-dualism, there is difference, but there's not separate. There's not separation. Everything is part is is one. And it's like you're an organism made up of a lot of different organisms. You could say half of half of the organisms in your body aren't even you. If you're, you're more bacteria than you are human cells, you know, it's, and, but we don't think of these as being separate. Like if you were to think of a, a brain cell or a skin cell or anything like that, it has its own function. It has its own nuclei, its own uh, job and work. And it's, it's working towards a greater good. And you could say that it's, it's, it's also the perspective, like how close or how far do you get? The farther you move away from something, the bigger the picture that you see. And that's really challenging for anybody to do because we're so close to who we are. It's like when, um, you know, we used to think that the, the, the earth was the center of the universe. 
And then we thought the sun was the center of the universe. And it, it appears out the universe or like our solar system isn't even the center of the universe. It's like, uh, it's as, as you open up the lens, as you, as you become less myopic to what it is, you, you get a bigger picture. And for that was to see myself as not being the center of everything, right? It was for, for forever. It was always about what I saw, what I experienced, how things affected me. It wasn't about how I affected other things so much, except for the people in my life that if I affected them negative, it would affect me negative. And so then I want to be more altruistic towards those people. But if it was some of that I didn't have any effect over or they didn't have any effect over me, I'd be more selfish to those people because they were insignificant to my journey. And, and now as I look at it, I don't see myself as, as this is the Dylan experience, right? This is, I'm, I'm, I'm the center of this story. I'm the one going, I see myself as a part of, uh, as a part of this whole, like in yoga, it's called a Leela, which is like a, a story or, um, this, um, what, what we're all going through. And so it, it changes how you see other people. It changes how you see yourself and, and the purpose of those things. And I, and that's one that, it's, you know, it's something that you could explain, something you could hear about in a podcast like this or read in a lot of books, but until you start to actually shift that perspective and, and change how you perceive people, yourself, life, things, activity, time, you know, past, present, future, all those things, you will continue to have this, this myopic point of view that the world revolves around you and this is about you. And that's always going to lead to more suffering because naturally we can't be happy. And that's, that's comes from evolution. That's survival. That's like the whole, the whole reason we're here. Uh, I know we're going over a lot of things and I, I appreciate you letting me talk like yeah. this. Uh, yeah, I was having a conversation with Dom, our, yeah. our, our mutual friend here. And we we're talking, he asked me if I ever wanted kids. And for a long time I said, no, I don't, I don't want kids. You know, I don't want to, I don't feel the need to add to the growing population of the planet. But then I thought like, maybe I do want kids. If I, if I think about what the purpose of humanity or the purpose of life, all life in general on this planet, since life has been conceived is to make more life. Every, every single organism, every single organism has one goal is to replicate. And everything that it does is towards that replication. You see a, lo a lot of different insects and animals and I mean, animals are insects or insects are animals technically, but plants, whatever, whatever it is, bacteria, viruses, they're all trying to just replicate. And some will give everything their life towards that goal of replication. And if I think of like, if I go with the purpose of the universe and yogis love to talk about like looking towards the universe, but the, what the universe really wants you to do is to just duplicate. That's it. To pass your genes on mm -hmm. in any way. And there's nothing romantic. There's nothing philosophical. There's nothing about that other than like kind of fulfilling your purpose on, on there. And so like, if I look at it, that lens, like, yeah, I want to have, yeah, maybe a kid or something. Mm. And, and it's also just to like have that experience from that. I'd be happy if I, I didn't because I'll, be, you know, either way be happy. Yeah. Content. Content. Mm. Yeah. My, my teacher says like, uh, Shiva Das, he's, I think he's 74 this year. Uh, he, no, he's 74 now uh, in January. He says that the purpose of life is not to be happy, but to realize that you're whole. And we're all we're all thinking that something is missing, and that, and that was a big problem in my life when I came into yoga. Is I thought something was missing. I was looking towards my my future as it, it's something that happens. When, the younger you are, the more you look towards your future. Is that it offers a new reality for life to be better, and so you're always pursuing that new reality, and it leaves you dissatisfied with the reality you have. And that was very much true of me, especially my, you know, when I was like right around 30 years old, I had become a firefighter, uh, 28, I think is when I got hired on. Like, and yeah, I was, a, I was a firefighter paramedic. That was like kind of my goal. Uh, I had a house that I bought I had a beautiful girlfriend. I had lots of great friends. I was doing fun things. And I was just on this pursuit of, of more and more and more. 
but every time you you receive something, I mean, it's this is this is probably the most basic philosophy there is, like that anybody could talk about is like get, getting more is not going to make you happy. Uh, but for some reason, it's the hardest lesson for anyone to to learn because we're like, well, the future self, my future self, will be better than who I currently am. I think it's perpetuated by society as well, right? Like everywhere, everywhere we look, it's just, it's just more is being rammed down our throat. Like, look, more, more, like more will make you happy, and it's just we we equate that to happiness. Yeah, I, I mean, it makes sense. We are we live in a capitalistic society. C- yeah. Consumerism is you're either one of two things, you're a creator or a consumer, or most likely you're both a creator and a consumer. And, and so it's like, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to create and you're trying to consume and, and for, for capitalism to move forward, you need to buy. Mm. Uh, And I buy things like now, now even more because I have, I finally have a home to put things in, but I lived uh, the greater part of a decade with just a suitcase. And so i I only bought experiences, which is a nice thing. And I prefer spending money on experiences rather than things and actually buying things, buying clothes. I have three pairs of shoes now, mm-hmm. which is the, the most pairs of shoes that I've, I've ever had. And two of them are for skateboarding. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's like the, those kinds of things. Yeah. We, we are told to buy, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with buying things. I don't think there's anything like if you, if if buying an, a, a new pair of shorts or a purse or, or whatever it is that, that you like, a car, I don't know, if, if that brings you some joy, great. Like, there's no reason to, to judge that. Yep. You know, it's, we don't need to be aesthetic monks and denounce everything. We just need to change the perspective of what those things really are. If we look at those things as, as like, that's not going to make me any more happy than I was without it, but I like it, then, you know, that's, you're, you're going to, respect that purchase a lot more and and that item is actually going to serve you in a a, a much higher capacity than if you're thinking like oh if i get this car you know people are going to see me different Mm. you know if i get another ten thousand followers on instagram i'm going to be (laughs) uh people like me more and 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 if if people like me more then i could like myself more Mm. yeah and it's that attachment isn't it to the goals like yeah. these future-based goals and having the attachment and then attaching a meaning to what it means to have these things. That's where I think the more suffering is caused by our own self, just attaching to these things that we think are, you know, going to make us happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when, how did you change your self-image and what was your, yeah, what was your self-image um, before, before yoga? Like how did you see yourself before you even got into the practice? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know how I really saw myself. And I don't know if I ever like even really looked at myself that Mm. closely as to be like, this is who I am or this is how I am or whatever. I was always pursuing what I wanted to be rather than acknowledging who I was. Uh, but I think like through my, my late twenties, early thirties, I felt like I was a pretty cool guy played in a rock band had fun. And that was good. It's kind of my whole life was that, but like deep down, I wasn't happy. But if you asked me, I would say I was happy because I mean, from the outside, it looked like I was happy. Uh, My friends would say I was happy, but I could tell, I, I could just tell you I wasn't happy by every failed relationship that I had, every girlfriend that, that was amazing, that didn't work out, wasn't because of them or it was because of me not loving myself enough to be able to love someone else and to be able to show up vulnerable vulnerable is an interesting word to talk about uh, but um yeah it wasn't about i didn't love myself enough to to be able to show up for anybody else in the capacity that i needed to to have a good relationship yeah so i don't i didn't know if like if i had the the capacity to to view myself in an honest way Mm. Yeah. So whatever my thought of myself back then would not have been an honest thought. It wouldn't have been like how I see myself now. Mm. You mentioned that vulnerable, you had struggles being vulnerable. Would you say that's true or just? Actually, I, I don't have too much. I don't know if I had struggles being vulnerable then 
or if I have struggles being vulnerable now. But I think why, why I said vulnerable is an interesting word to unpack. It's because of how that word has changed, it, especially in like the conscious mindfulness community. Like, uh, and I didn't really realize this until I was having a conversation with somebody that was much younger than me. That was, you know, like 25 years old, very intelligent, very cool kid. He, um, yeah, really knowledgeable in philosophy and everything. But he, he was actually like kind of turned off from that word vulnerable because he had a different definition of it than what I thought. And the, and the more that I, I, I kind of see or understand the, what that word is and you see like the vulnerable, vulner, vulnerable AF and like those kinds <laughs> of things and like being vulnerable. Is, it's like, I, I don't know if people really understand what that word means or they do understand what the word means, but it's defined so differently. Like for how, how would you define vulnerable being vulnerable? Um, I think for me, um, I think vulner being vulnerable is just, uh, letting people know the things that you really want to hide. But when you, when you share those things, it helps you connect deeper with someone. Yeah. That's how I'd see it. That's how I see it. I think when it comes to defining any word, uh, and this is, this is another thing that it's, I've realized over the past couple of years is that there isn't a right definition to that. Like, so your definition is 100% right, even if it's 100% different than my definition. And I think we need to recognize that with, when we communicate with other people to help improve our communication, that we define words differently based on our experience and all words are defined based on experience. I mean, we have objective words like this table, you know, it's like, mm. we both will agree that this is a table mm -hmm. um, or, you know, like those kinds of things. But if we talk about a word like vulnerable or love or fear, we're, we're going to have different definitions of what those are based on how we've been exposed to those things. And we only know, we only know the world through our experiences. So vulnerable I think the the way that I take it, which is not far off from the way that you take it, is it's it's the level or the part of yourself or the experience where change happens and where you're open to being hurt. And I think that's really like when we when you talk about being vulnerable, it's it's being open to being hurt. And we, we generally are only vulnerable with the people that we trust the most because we trust them not to hurt us. Yeah. I, I actually, I think I wrote about this, uh, not necessarily vulnerability, but trust uh, not, not too long ago. Uh, and for me, for, for, uh, for a long time, uh, being vulnerable meant that I really had to trust the person that I was there to be able to open up and expose those things, uh, those, those deep, deep, dark parts of my life that I wouldn't even want to admit to myself because you say those things, you're like, Oh, I'm this, whatever. And, and you're like, Oh, well people like that are, are, you know, stupid. <laughs> like, you, know, you know, it's like you, you, you're opening yourself up to a deep le level of judgment and scrutiny that uh, could actually hurt you and, and affect you in a negative way. But what I realized was it's not about trusting other people. It's about trusting myself. Uh, that I could be vulnerable and show up in whatever capacity as open to being hurt by other people, but know that even if I am hurt by those people that I'm strong enough to pick myself back up. And like once, once you realize that about yourself, that every pain, every heartache ev is an opportunity for growth, then you learn to show up and be more vulnerable more often and to actually be honest and open with people to like, I freely tell people about the things that I'm embarrassed about, like openly, like, and it's, it, you know, we're, we're having a conversation that that's a deeper level conversation. And this is a conversation that actually is bringing us deeper into that vulnerability level. Like if we get into those, those places, like where we actually are starting to talk about personal things about uh, our, you know, what happened in our past life or past life or our past by our like, not past lives, but like this life, what, what happened in our past or mm -hmm. our traumas, those, those things that have affected us, it allows us to, to actually see each other for who we are rather than who we're pretending to be. Mm -hmm. Most of our conversations that we have with people are very superficial, which is normal. It's fine. There's not, there's no judgment against that. There's nothing wrong with having a superficial conversation. Hey, how are you? What's going on? What have you been up to? Those are, 
that's, that's how we operate most of the time. But I don't like having those conversations as much. I like to have conversations that are like, you know, what's, what's on, what's on your heart? Like what's, you know, what's either lifting you up or bringing you down or like, you know, like to go deeper into that human experience, to have more of a menial, meaningful conversation, we need to open up to those, those areas of vulnerability where we actually can be hurt. But once you do that, you realize that even strangers are, are usually strangers are more trustworthy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's why things like women's circles and men's circles do so well. And in my trainings, we do things called satya circles where satya means truth. And it's just a, it's just like you, anything, it's just a circle where you hold space and you allow someone to be honest and go into those things without judgment, without um, feedback, without somebody trying to help you, just the process of bringing it to the surface. You know, when you stir the pot, things, things tend to ride to the surface. Like if you imagine, if you imagine you're, you look at a, a glass here and if this glass, if the bottom of the glass, if I fill it up with sediment like this and I let it sit there, it's all that sediment is going to sit to the bottom. And if I look at it on the surface level, it looks clear mm -hmm. and it looks like everything's okay. Right. Yeah. And this is, this is how we see ourselves, right? When we're talking to people, we're, we're like, everything's fine. I didn't disturb anything. And so everything's okay. And, and on the surface level, right. it looks, it looks clear. But as soon as you start to get to those deeper levels and you stir it up, you see, you see those waters become muddy and you see all that sediment, all that junk come to the top. But that's how you get rid of it. That's how you work through it. Because if you just leave it on the bottom, it's always going to stay on the bottom. And the second anything touches that, the second any anything stirs that up a little bit, it's going to affect everything. But you, you have to start to remove that sediment from your life. And the only way to do that is to, to, is to bring it up. Um, so I'm, I'm more interested in those conversations and, and being vulnerable. The people that hurt you are usually the people that, that love you that are unhappy with themselves. Mm. Uh, at least in my experience, this isn't any rules of law or anything like that, but it's, you know, people treat people based on how they feel about themselves. And, and if you look at the world, most of the world is hurting yeah. and is, is pretty unhappy. And it's really hard to see someone else, especially if you're a happy person, if you're, if you're with somebody and you're happy and your partner does the tax you and stuff, it's not because of you. It's because there's something that's hurting them and seeing your happiness as a reflection of their unhappiness. And so that generally is, is projected out. And as you're saying that I'm thinking about so many instances where I've pushed, pushed partners away because I was not happy with myself mm -hmm. and I was projecting onto them, you know, um, maybe you've had similar experiences where you've done something of that sort. Yeah. Basically all yeah. of them, all of them until, uh, except for my last few relationships, yeah, it took me a long, t long time like, to overcome that. Right, and, and the other thing that we do with that is we justify that. That is, you, you justify everything. Every, every action that we do, we justify. That's not just justifying is not a bad thing, but it's it can be. It it, it could be bad as as is when you hurt people or you do bad things and you justify them as being good. I mean, even like right now with the 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 war in Ukraine and stuff, like. Putin, um, do you think he's doing something bad? I mean, the, the whole world, the whole world will agree that what he's doing is an atrocity, yeah. but he justifies it as he's trying to reunite mother Russia or whatever other reasons that he's, he's doing this for, you know, even if it's, even if he's doing it just for power and control or, or whatever, He's going to justify it as something else that makes it okay, that makes it right. And we need to look at our actions and decisions that we do and how we treat people uh, and the reasons why we do that and actually see that not as ourself because you're always going to justify something because no one ever wants to be wrong. No one ever wants to, you know, you hurt somebody and you're like, well, it was for a good reason, you know, what was it? Right. Well, and that's... So that that that's hard to do. So if I look back to, to my relationships, I was constantly hurting people and thinking in, to myself openly and honestly that they were in the wrong when, when really it was about me and it was about my hurt. And yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause um, there's 
in the yoga world there's uh, so, so many yoga memes and stuff about yoga teachers <laughs> how mm. yoga teachers are the most messed up people that's why they're teaching yoga and stuff like that there's like all these memes and stuff what do you think about that concept it's like <laughs> do you think that's true or <laughs> i don't know anybody that's not messed up in some capacity yeah uh a long time ago i i wrote a little caption that said yoga is a place where broken people come to realize that they're not broken and I think, again, it's just coming down to this idea of pers perspective as, yeah, we're, we're all messed up. And, and you look at the people that lead a, I've never been an alcoholic or a, a, I don't have an addictive personality so mm. much. Uh, but the people that lead those meetings come from those meetings. Mm. Right. Any any kind of leader or something comes up through that system. And, and the reason why most people go to something like that is because they're looking for help. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, I mean, I'm not, I don't claim to have any answers. I don't, anything that I know, I learned it from someone else, right? And it's just how I put it into my, my own experience. There's no knowledge that's new. Mm -hmm. If, you know, you have a, a lot of, a lot of amazing books back here and, and they are all really pulling from the, the wisdom and from the ancient sages, the, mm -hmm. the people that were closest to nature and, and, and looked within themselves the most. And that's one of the difficulties that we have today is, is life is just, things are coming at us so fast and changing so rapidly that we don't have the attention span to look within because there's so much external external influence from everything and telling us that we should be this way or look like this or do this. And uh, especially for like the younger kids coming up that grew up with an iPhone in their hand and social media and, and all these things, it's really, it's really hard to be objective about anything. And so, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's a challenging world to be a to be a child now, for sure. With social media, imagine like if we grew up with social media, how how fucked up we would, how even more messed up we'd be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, I mean, there's there's definitely advantages and disadvantages mm -hmm. for it for sure. It's uh, you know, any tool could be a weapon depending on how you hold it, right? Mm. And and I think that's really important. Uh, it's not to demonize social media or or even like how the world is progressing, you know, and, and as far as like everything, media in general, how the, the general narrative is, is being moved though. Like, well, uh, now just saying that like a lot of that stuff does need some scrutiny for sure um, for how information is spread. And, but uh, the, 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 t the tools are being used in a very negative way. Like social media, it, I remember when I first started Instagram, I started my Instagram in 2013 and I was living in LA. I was teaching yoga down there. I was, I was uh, kind of in a half yoga community, half calisthenics movement community. And just like every day was with, with friends and having fun and sharing stuff. And if, when I look at my, my social media, if I look at all the other people that have come up that they all have a hundred K plus like most of them over like 500 K, uh, we all started together, like in the same kind of community. And it was through, through pushing each other and interacting. And now I have friends all over the world that I wouldn't have or know, or, or, uh, ever like had contact with if it wasn't for social media. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for, it. I wouldn't be in the position that I'm at, in right now if it wasn't for social media. So it's, again, it's, it's how do we use that tool? Like, so like social media is, is a really good way to connect, but I, I probably spend less than 15 minutes a day on Instagram now. Like, um, I really just go on to check messages and stuff. I, I rarely post, I should do it more. But it's that's not really the priority because the tools got me to the place where I need to be, and so I don't need it as much anymore. So I'm not I'm not addicted to that. But uh, you know the way like young people come into it, it's like everything is about that, and it's more about that interaction with what's going on in their hand than it is about the interaction with other people. It's how can I take this interaction that's you know that's connecting me to people that I would never have the ability to be connected to, and 
make turn those into real connections and you know or learn from it like youtube is probably one of the greatest websites out there you could get lost in days watching you know useless things or conspiracies or whatever or you could betterment yourself in basically every way like the we're living in a time where all knowledge is readily available to us. And just, you know, I mean, you used to have to go to a library and you'd open up a book and that would be everything written about that one thing. Like it's, and now it's, it's, um, yeah, all the information is there. So I do, I do feel for the kids coming up, but I'm also, little jealous of them as as well like i i would have loved to you know, before we started talking about guitar and stuff and i've been playing guitar for a long time and i'm not that good <laughs> <laughs> uh, i would have i would have loved to have been a kid growing up with youtube and and all these different guitar programs to be able to learn from masters for free from like anywhere in the world that that would have been amazing i, I do it now like I'm, I'm always on YouTube, like learning new songs and stuff, learning it that way. But when I was a kid to learn something, you would have to go to guitar center, buy a, buy the book, the tab book, which most of the time was wrong, where you just like listen to the, the album by ear and, and try to figure it out. That's how I learned music. And he taught me, I have a really good ear now, mm -hmm. but uh, the learning process was much slower. So mm -hmm. we, yes, we, We've accelerated our ability to assimilate knowledge and spread knowledge, but we've also lost our ability to hold focus and concentration. And, and these are generalities, of course, it's not for everybody, but if we look at the masses, that's kind of where we're going to and, and, and what's happening. And also with that, it's, you know, when we're talking about the image of you asking, like, how did I see myself or look at myself? It was a lot easier back then because when I compared myself to others, it was just my group of friends. It was just the people that I knew. And also I knew them. So I knew what their lives were really like. It wasn't, it wasn't this facade of, of who they were. Now, you know, we, we look on social media and, and everybody puts up their best self and there's nothing wrong with that. You should, you should put your best self forward. You should like think of yourself as your best self. You shouldn't think of yourself as your worst self. Like what's like always work on those things, but that's not who you are. You're, you're not your flaws. You're not, you, you're not your shortcomings and stuff. Like, present present that image of yourself that's fine but know that everybody is doing that and there's not you know we we think like yeah it's just this this false precept this false perception of of who others are and so then we look at ourselves and we just we see the best selves in other people then we look at ourselves and we see the worst part of ourself and then we compare those two and it's it's like apples and oranges and um yeah, there's a lot of people that are hurting and suffering from that because they feel like they're not enough. And it goes back to like, what are we looking for? Is it to be happy or is it to feel that you're whole? The thing about being whole is you're born whole. You don't have to add anything to that to be more of that. And you can't take anything away from that because the whole is the whole. It's not, there's, it's not an add or subtraction. It's not a, it's not a quantitative thing. And it is, it is the encompassing everything. And once you start to recognize yourself as that, then it's less about pursuing or removing. And, and, and that's really like the, what the, I think the middle way of Buddhism is, is, is about. Like the Tao, Tao Te Ching? Yeah. Yeah, the middle way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love the, the, the scriptures because like you said, all the books, they, they come from that that source of wisdom, right? And it's just like a rehash of their life experiences in, in the books. And yeah, I think life is life is very interesting when you when you let go of the attachments to what you want. So, for example, someone can look at your Instagram and be like, "Wow, you've got like more than eight hundred thousand followers," you know? Like, of course, he's got more eight hundred thousand followers. Look, he's got an amazing life, you know. He's doing handstands, he's doing all these arm balances, and he's teaching yoga around the world and stuff like that. And it's easy for someone to just compare themselves to you and be like, "Wow, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm a good yoga teacher, but I'm nowhere near as good as Dylan." And you know, they can just get in that comparison trap and then just you know, feel depressed every day about their life. And so um, my question to you is, when you were growing your Instagram, did you have an attachment to 
to the numbers or were you just were you just uh, focusing on your practice in the beginning i th- uh i was well when when i first started like it wasn't i think i had one friend that had like a thousand followers and we're like wow like insta famous like that <laughs> Like, like how how did you get a thousand followers? It blew me away that that was a thing, mm. uh, and it took me it took me a year of trying to grow my Instagram to get to ten thousand followers, and I, I I was there. It was new in Instagram, so there wasn't all these bots. There wasn't there wasn't all these weird things. When you posted, it came up in chronological order. There wasn't even video yet, mm. you know. So it was just photos, and I was just taking pictures with my phone and and stealing some caption from like some roomy quote you know <laughs> like throwing it up there like very like so it wasn't so much about that but then it was more about like the community of the people that I was with and hanging out with them and supporting them and I definitely did try to grow it for a bit uh and my way of growing it was just posting every day that that's the only thing that I did in the beginning and then and then it became as I, as I started to get more into like the comments and the feedback and, and, and stuff, I started to write more. Uh, that was when I first became a yoga teacher, I felt like I was a movement teacher because all I did was teach movement. I didn't really teach any philosophy and it took me because I didn't feel comfortable teaching philosophy. Like who, who was I to yeah. tell somebody, you know, anything that had any depth or importance? Like I didn't feel, uh, I didn't, believe in myself enough in my knowledge and my experience, but I knew I was a good mover and I, I knew anatomy and, and those kinds of things. So I felt fine sharing that, but it, but then what it came down to is like, I have lived a really interesting life. I had a very rough childhood, uh, very tumultuous, like most people. And, and that comes down to the, how do you view your childhood? Like we could have the, mm. like, most most people view their childhood as being bad because you're a kid, right? And that's like, it's you, you're viewing that in, as as like a five year old, a thirteen year old, or whatever, and you're remembering those mem- those memories that you have are thirteen year old memories or mm-hmm. or twelve year old, mem- you know what I mean? Like yeah. you're remembering things as that. So of course we're always going to think of those as as kind of challenging, uh, but we share that story, so it's it's nothing that's new and and that's and that's actually something that brings people together is to be able to share a story even though the details might be different the sentiment uh, the sentiment is the same how we feel about it's the same but i was also i was also a war veteran um which is unique and unfortunate but not a lot of people have been to war uh unfortunately i have uh I worked as a paramedic for eight years. So I saw a lot of life and death every single day. And that gave me a unique perspective. Uh, Yeah, I just, I I felt like I had at at least, I mean, we all have a perspective. We all have something to share. We all have a story. And it's like in how did we overcome those things or how did we move through that? That's what people want to hear because we're looking at our own story and we're looking at someone else's story. This is what social media is. We're seeing how someone moved past that and we go, well, yeah, maybe I could, I'm also struggling with this. Maybe I can move past that too. And then you start to build your tribe. And, and that's what I started to do. So I started to share things. Now, as, as I write more, it's less personal and I try to speak more because I've gotten to a place where it's not really about me or what I've done, but it's about sharing things that are, that are truths that are hard to, hard to disagree with because, I mean, you could disagree with whatever, but because they're so apparently true, um, and yet helpful, right? Like that little story of, of like, I want to wish where I'm content, like who doesn't want to be content? And, And you think about that, that those little things, and speak to you and, and they touch you. And so it got, it became more about sharing those things than it became about building a following. And then my following really started to build when I started to travel and teach and it was going, I was doing on average, like a, a new country every single week going out and teaching. And, and that was, that was how I built my Instagram so fast, you know, going to a new community, everyone has Instagram, they, they tag you, 
I, I'd leave and I'd have a, from that weekend, I have a thousand more followers just from that organic reach spread out. It wasn't about what I was posting, it was about what people were sharing. And that's how I continue to grow. And, and I could see it, like my growth is pretty stagnant. Well, mostly because I don't post, but it's pretty stagnant when I'm in one place. And, and during the pandemic, I have hardly grown at all. But when I go back to traveling and I'm going back to those communities and sharing and stuff, then it starts to grow in that way. And so I'm much more about this organic growth. Uh, I don't care about the number. It's not about having getting to a million followers or anything like that. There's a there's like a funny little meme with Arnold Schwarzenegger that they asked him like um, something that like it, uh, like he was talking about money. He said, uh, you know, um, having more money doesn't make you more happy. You know, I have fifty million dollars now. I'm not any more happy than I was when I had thirty million dollars. <laughs> you know, right. so it's like. It's a, it's a joke because like $30 million is still a lot, but like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I have 800,000 followers. I'm not going to be happier when I have a million followers. Like what's, or, you know, I'm not any more happy than I had 10,000 followers. I was still just doing my thing as uh, the same. So, but what does change is the, my ability, the capacity to be able to reach more people. But then it's, you always have to play the, the quantity versus quality game. And for me, it's, it's always about the quality. I'm, I'm happy to talk to 800,000 people and change one person's life than to talk to 8 million people and change no one's life, you know? So, yeah. uh, that, that's what I focus on. And, you know, I, I try to put stuff out there, at least in my writing that will help to spark new ideas to open doors as, as a teacher, that's all you're trying to do is open a door for someone else and saying like, walk through this door. Because the journey is the journey is yours. I mean, there's, there's we learn through experience, and no teacher can teach you experience. They can only show you where experience lies, and then you have to make the journey yourself. And so that's really what I try to do with everything: my writing, with um, my teaching, with my life, who I am. You know, as as every teacher should be an example through some sort of capacity. Mm. You know, you should look at the teachers that aren't living what they preach and question their teachings. Yeah, and I think that's why you've grown so much and, you know, why you've been all over the world doing all these workshops is because your commitment to mastery is just evident, right? Like you're continuously growing your practice and, you know, your experience is just growing every day. And that's um, that's something that I want to talk to you, talk to you about is your daily routine, because that's quite a, a rigorous daily routine, even for for people. Because I've known a lot of yogis as before, and people in the yoga world, even people in the yoga world, don't practice that as much as you do on a daily basis and have it be consistent. So your routine takes about three and a half hours. Is is that correct? Yeah, I mean, you see me every morning. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, yeah. I'm really. I I, I first have to say is I'm incredibly f fortunate enough to have that time, and and that's something that most people with their lives they they don't have the time to put three and a half hours into a practice. And my practice actually starts in the morning, even before I wake up and I, I do at least 30 minutes of meditation followed by, by a, a deep pranayama practice. Uh, then I go to the gym and do my movement. And it's like, a it's about 45 minutes or so of just mobility work that I work through, I'm working through a lot of different properties of fascia, elasticity, plasticity, viscoelasticity through that. And then I get into uh, a handstand routine, which kind of changes. It's pretty consistent, but it's like, it changes a little bit of what I add into it. And that takes about an hour of just working through handstands. And I should be way better at handstands for as much as I practice them. But you know, <laughs> it's, it's again, it's like that, that judging thing. It's, it's not about, if, if I was to, to go with that mindset of like, as much as I practice handstands, I should be really good at handstands. I'm, I'm not bad, but you know, if I was thinking I should, I should be like all these other like amazing, and I compare myself to like the Cirque du Soleil people, like the professional arm balancers that are do, like doing figas and other crazy things. Mm. Um, then I'd probably give up or with guitar. I've been, as long as I've been playing guitar, I should be way better than I am. But it, for me, it's, it's not about that. It's like, I really just love doing handstands. I like to practice them and I want to give my best to something that I love. And so it becomes more about 
uh, the practice being about giving my best to it and whatever that means. And sometimes my best is better on some days than the others. Like today, my best wasn't, wasn't as good as my best was yesterday, mm-hmm. you know? So, and, and it's, and then that's where that Santosha comes from. It is like, just being like, yeah, it's okay. It's okay to, to, yeah. it's okay to have down days. Uh, yeah. That's refreshing to hear because I have the same story about jujitsu. I'm like, fuck, man, for the amount of time I trained jujitsu, I should be way better. Yeah. And I heard a black belt when I first started jujitsu, I heard a black belt say the same thing. And it just made me, I just thought about it the other day. I was like, wow, he said that and he's been training for 10 years and he still thinks that he should be better than he is. It's like, but like you said, you have to just uh, love the practice. Yeah. That's it. Falling in love, love, love with the practice, right? Yeah, I, I work. I work splits, front splits, middle splits every single day. They're still hard for me. Mm. I've been doing that for ten years. Wow. They're still hard. Like my body doesn't naturally want to do that. It's okay. Mm. Does it, I'm not going to stop doing it. Mm. I'm like I'm learning how to skateboard right now, and I'm awful at skateboarding. Uh, from what I hear, I'm I'm really good for as little yeah, as Dom I've, said you're really good. Yeah, as for for how long I've been doing it, but I think that just comes down to. Um, crossover from snowboarding and wakeboarding and and hand balancing and stuff just having body awareness and proprioception all that but you know when i look at like these kids that are 13 years old do, like just doing crazy crazy stuff and it's like at that kid at 13 is better than i'll ever be right it's it's enough to be like you know i'm 41 years old like i'll never be as good as a 13 year old but why does that matter like, am I still having fun with it? True. Am I, when I show up, who am I showing up for? Am I showing up to be better than these, these kids coming up for it or better than anyone else? Or am I showing up because I enjoy it? And, and that's, that's why my practice is what is what it is. It's not because I'm working towards something. It's because I enjoy it. I actually really, uh, a long time ago, I don't remember, I heard an interview with somebody and I, I took it as my own. Uh, they asked why you, they asked this person, I don't even remember who it is, why do you, why do you practice yoga? And they said, well, um, the days that I don't practice yoga, I don't feel as good as the days that I do practice yoga. I was like, oh, that's a good enough reason. You know? yeah. And I and I, it's the same for me. The days mm-hmm. that I don't practice, like uh, last week I skipped Tuesday. Yeah, I, I remember that very clearly because Tuesday I didn't feel as good as I did Monday or Wednesday. Mm. And so... And it's like my rest day. Like I, I right now in Bali, I'm teaching on Sundays only. I just got two classes left here. Then I go on tour uh, for till November. But it's like I, I practice at Nirvana Monday through Friday, and then on Saturday I do about a four hour self practice at home where I'm creating the class for Sunday. And then Sunday I don't practice. It's my rest day, but I teach, so I'm still in in the yoga. And I, and I get even more out of teaching than I do from practicing. And then Monday I start right back in at it. And so it's like every day I'm, I'm being fulfilled by, by that thing that I love. Mm. And how long have you been doing, uh, so you've been practicing like this for, since you started yoga or when did you start practicing three and a half hours a day? Uh, I mean, it's, it fluctuates based on, on how my life is, but Mm -hmm. the, so when I was doing martial arts, it was really just like once a week. So I, like when I said, I started when yeah. I started when I was around 20 or so. Uh, but when I was like 29, that's, yeah, 29 is when I started doing like a three hour, four hour practice every day. And there, like that's fluctuated, it's gone up and down, but that's kind of when it, when it started to do this hard practice. That was because I was a firefighter when I started. And so I had... I had the time, like I had four days off and then at the station I had two days and when I was at the fire station, we were given time to work out. And so I had like an hour of workout time during the day. And then after five, when, if, you know, we didn't have calls, there was, is either watch TV, read, or, you know, that was like, or for me practice. And so I just would always do a practice, try to get that in. And then on my, my days off, I would take a yoga class and do a self practice every day. Sometimes two yoga classes. I'd like to do back to back yoga classes. So I was I was pretty pretty into it, but it was I was on this journey um, to to trying to be happy, and I and 
the more I practiced, it was like the happier I was. And then I realized it wasn't about the practice, but what the practice was showing me. And once I was able to make that, that switch, then the practice became even better because I wasn't practicing to be happy. I was happy to practice. Mm, I love that. I love that. That's, I feel like a lot of people are trying to get to that place where they're happy to practice. Yeah. Like myself included, like, you know, like being happy to practice, that's, because when you're happy to practice, you can commit to three and a half hours a day and do that consistently because mm -hmm. you're happy to do it. Yeah. It's not like, oh, fuck, I got to fucking work out again. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, surfers or skaters or, you know, it's anything else. Like you talk to somebody that loves surfing, they're in the water every single day. And they're not, they're not in the water because they're trying to practice to be better. They're in the water because they love being in the water. And I think, I think with yoga, like if, if your yoga practice isn't that for you, then maybe it's, maybe do something else, you know, mm -hmm. like the mindfulness and uh, uh, all, all these philosophies that come with yoga aren't exclusive to yoga. You don't have to do body movement to do that. You could do that through running. You could do that through anything where you're physical. I think it is important to be physical because if we are, if we are not in touch in tune with our body, if we, if, if the container doesn't feel good, if it doesn't hold the contents and the, con the contents are, aren't a value, you know, if this glass of water is, if it's broken, it's not a very good, good container and I can't expect the contents in it to hold. Right. And so it's, it's important for our containers to be healthy, uh, for the contents to be happy. And so those two go hand in hand. So that's another reason why, I, I mean, People are, are usually surprised when I tell them I'm 41. I don't know why. I feel like I, I, I see it in my face, you know. But um, I think it's because usually when people get into their 40s, they let their bodies go. Mm. And it's um, that, that being fit. Because to be fit in your 40s takes dedication. Absolutely. And you can't, you know, uh, who is, I think I was talking to my mom um, and uh, about something and i told her i'm like i'm gonna have a six pack when i'm 60 and she's asking like about when i was 70 or whatever uh dating girls younger than me or whatever yeah <laughs> uh, uh yeah because she's like when am i gonna have kids my, my little sister just had it had a kid and i'm like i'll have a kid she's like you're getting older i'm like yeah but I, just because I get older doesn't mean that the like my girlfriend is going to be old. <laughs> I'm, I'm just right. messing around. Um, but that's true, though. But yeah, <laughs> and and she's like, yeah. But then like when you're in your 60s or whatever, I'm like, I'll be I'll be great in my 60s or in my 70s, and that's because she said there's a this is a and just a little story. Like when I was little, there's a guy named Jack Lalane. Oh yeah. Yeah. You the heard of him? Guy. Yeah. The juice guy. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was little, um, he held me as a baby in Palm Springs. All right. Like, I don't, I don't know how they met or whatever, but, um, so my mom says like he, he rubbed off on me cause he was, he was fit until he, I think he died in his nineties of pneumonia, mm. but he was still doing like, I don't know, like 20 or pull-ups or 40 pull-ups or something every single day and a couple hundred push-ups and like, yep. yeah. So we, you know, we get old and we stop moving. It's not, it's not the other way around. We don't stop moving because we're old. That's what a lot of people will think, right? Um, the, the big, I think the biggest myth with uh, just our physical body as we age is that, oh yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm 50, like of course I can't move, but move well. That's what most people believe. But since I came to Bali and came to Nirvana, I realized that that's not true. Like, that's really not. Like, I mean, you're 41, you move better than me, and I'm eight, nine years younger than you, you know? So that's clearly not true. It's just about the practice, right? Like, what you're committing to and finding your lane, I guess, what it, guess what it is, right? Like, you found your thing that you love. Yeah. Whereas a lot of other people, they haven't found that. And so they feel like moving is a chore for them. Yeah. 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 It should never be that, mm. but you definitely need to find what, what's, what sparks joy. Mm. Yeah. For yeah. me, it's, it's, it's yoga, rock climbing, rock climbing is another like thing, just being connected to the body. Yeah. What is movement for you? Like you said before that you find yourself through movement. What is, what, can you break that down for us? That concept of how you find yourself through moving? 
Well, I, I think, I mean, there's a couple different ways I can answer this, but I, if I go through the yogi way, since I'm here as representing yoga or whatever. <laughs> so yoga, what it, with the philosophy of yoga, it's this, this mind-body connection thing. It's, it's not that the mind, the body, the breath, the spirit are different, but it's, they're, they're all the same. And so if one, if one is being neglected, the, they all suffer. And, and so for me, it's like, they're all important. You know, sleep is important. It's, I, I wrote a book on breathing and, and talking about the importance of breathing and, and it's just as important as movement, just as important as, as being happier or, or like having the right perspective, the right life, the, the right em emotional intelligence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. And so, so movement is just, it's just one side of that it's it's mm -hmm. it's necessary it's necessary for everything to do that and, and movement is freedom like freedom in your body you've been injured before we've yeah. all been injured yeah. and as soon as you're injured you lose that freedom you lose that autonomy to be able to to do what you want to do to be able to if i i have fun using my body and so when i lose my ability to to move my body everything else is affected by that it doesn't mean that I'll, I'm unhappy from it. Like la, uh, November of 2020, I rock climbing. I tore my gastrocnemius and my uh, and my ACL behind my knee. So like right where the the calf muscle comes into the the upper leg bone, the femur there. Um, yeah, I had a, I had a, a tear there, and I couldn't touch my toes. I couldn't do much from that and so like i really felt like i lost I, I lost my freedom i lost my ability to do what i love to do so i had to focus and change my focus so that it wasn't about that and so it's like with anything that is uh, a struggle or negative it's it's we always have two options from that and it's either do we choose to grow from it or do we ch choose to break down from it and that's like, it could be from your body breaking or from a relationship or loss of job or, or COVID or what, you know, whatever, whatever it is, family, um, you know, so we, we, we see those things and we look at them like the better thing to do is has, how do we see this as an opportunity for growth? And that really helps with the mental part of it. But for, for me, like I, I want to be able to move. You know, I definitely, uh, like I said, I, I, when I, when I practice, I have are better days than when I don't practice. So it's pretty important. Mm. And you've been a mover your whole life pretty much, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, uh, yeah, I started, I was, I was in my room a lot, mostly cause I was like grounded for like months at a time and from like a little kid, my uncle bought me this Hulk Hogan workout set and it's like had a poster and some like three pound concrete weights. It's like a kilo and a half or so, whatever. Uh, and I would just like sit in my room and work out as this like little kid. And <laughs> then, um, as I got older, I got into wrestling mm -hmm. and I was also like into, into other, other sports, uh, skiing and snowboarding, wakeboarding and that, um, yeah, and then I got into to wrestling when I was about 12, and that became my life until I was 22. I uh, started rock climbing when I was 14. And so it's like always doing something like that has always been a part of my life. Mm. So what would you say to someone who hasn't had that experience of moving, and they, they want to start moving? They want to be like Dylan, right? They want to... Well, I, no one should want to be like me. should always <laughs> just want to be like you. Right. Uh, yeah, if I find something that that you enjoy. And I think that's the most important thing. If you get into something and it's and it's work to do it, everything's going to be some a, a little bit of work. It's That's important. Like, things should be a challenge. That, that, yeah, there's, uh, I would say, two different pieces of advice here one it should be fun the other one it should be hard because we grow through challenge and if something is too easy one one of the reasons why i one of the things i, I attribute to me being a successful yoga teacher is i'm one of the hardest yoga teachers out there like i only teach a two like the shortest class i teach is two and a half hours yeah yeah and 
it's hard. And I, I do that because that's where the growth happens. If you come to my class and you could do everything, I feel like I failed you as a teacher. I feel like I didn't challenge you. I didn't, I didn't give you an opportunity. Challenge is that opportunity. The, you know, the obstacle is the way kind of thing. Uh, like we, we need something to push through, climb over, or, you know, like, or else we don't feel like we accomplished anything. And so that's, that's really important. But it should also be fun doing it. Mm. Yeah, I like that. The obstacle, like the, the challenge is, is the way, right? Yeah. Like if it's not challenging, and you're not, you're not making any progress. It's right. just too easy for you. Like, but so with that said, now you, I see you in the gym, you do handstand push-ups and all these kind of things and, you know, all these crazy movements that I don't even know the names of. And I don't either. Also, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm like, you're challenging yourself constantly. So do you, do you know when to increase? Like, let's say you're doing 10 reps of handstand push-ups. Do you know when to do 15? You know, do you know when to put... put yeah, put your- when, it, when it gets easy. Mm. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm doing something and it's easy, then I change it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how do I make it harder? Mm. And that just comes from... Where do you think that comes from, though? Like, that insatiable appetite to just go after more challenge. It's uh, our basic need for thriving. Mm. Our, our, our basic need is to grow, and the only way to grow is through challenge. Mm. And so if, if you're not growing, you're, you're not meeting that need. Mm. So, yeah. It's, I, I don't know. I, like, I'm always surprised about how successful I am as, as a yoga teacher because I feel like I'm teaching the obvious, and I think that's one of one of the things like that I'm gifted with as, as being a mover from such an, an early age is that I'm able to see the progression of a movement and, and how to make things harder, or easier, like, even as, as a teacher, like things that are how I got somewhere, like I could break it down in the steps to get there. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of just like it feels like a natural thing to be able to be like, okay, well, if I do this, the next step is this. And then if I do this, the next step is this. And so it's just, but again, it's not that pursuit to get to that next step. It's just I, I'm doing what is challenging me. And when it no longer challenges me, I need to find a new tool. Uh, it's like when I teach arm balances to people, you know, it's like uh, arm balances are really hard. Like, in, and especially if you've never done any before, like doing crow pose, which is probably the most basic of all the arm balances. But if you've never done it before, it, it's super challenging. But then once you get it, it is no longer challenging. And so why do you stay with crow? Mm. It's no longer doing what it was in the beginning. And it's not that the, the, you just you've graduated to something else now. It's like a single leg crow. Okay, well, now that's kind of too easy. Well, now dude, it's a single leg, single arm crow. And then it's a revolve single leg, single arm crow. And then it's like with a bind. And it's always just like, how, how do I push myself to something that is going to inspire growth? Mm. I think I find this fascinating because um, I've been doing calisthenics as well. And I, 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 le- I paid to learn muscle up and I can do a handstand and... For me, like when I when I can I can do the muscle up now, so I'm like, oh cool. So now the next step is to do more reps. So mm-hmm. like let's do five strict reps of muscle up on straight bar, and then okay after that it's like ten, you know. But then I'm like, eh, I can do five. It's all right, you know. Yeah. It's like that contentment just kicks in. That's okay too. Mm. Find something else. Mm, right. And it's yeah. like what what are what are muscle ups doing for you? It's, it's just a tool. Like we get focused. I mean, that's, that's with yoga too. Like I don't teach poses. I, I do when I'm, when I'm teaching hand balancing and arm balances and stuff, cause they're, they're aesthetically pretty. They, yeah. They're nice to look at, but when I'm teaching yoga, I don't care about the shape of a warrior two or the shape of a triangle. I care about what is that shape doing for the body? Uh, what, what part of my body is I'm, um, I work in. So I teach something called myofascial integrated alignment, which is about using the poses to structurally integrate, to, to remodel the body into a way that is more functional, has greater range of motion, uh, less asymmetries between the left and right side and, and more balance. And so you do that through a system of tension and compression. So every posture is creating tension and compression through the body. And so like 
we're trying to remove these these un, these um, misalignments and un, uh, balances. Un, that's not the right word. Um, yeah, we're trying to remove these these misalignments for the body. So I, I I choose the poses and I tune the poses to work into the body in that way. But I don't care about creating the shape of of these yoga poses. That's not the purpose. Like, why do you do the muscle up? Because um, it feels good, looks good. Feels good, it looks good. It's a skill. Yeah, you yeah. get it. But it's, once you have the skill, is it ser is it serving you anymore? Like doing a pull up makes you stronger. Right? Bigger lats. Doing a muscle up gives you that as well as some some push into that. So like it it's no longer about doing the muscle up, but what is the muscle up doing for your body? And so that's that like when I think about skills, like when I'm doing handstands, handstands is a little, uh, is a little different, but it's also like I don't do handstands just to do handstands. I do handstands because it's like, what is that doing for me? How does that feel? What is that progressing? And a lot of it, what handstands do for me are, are ch is like challenge, right? It's giving, it's like, especially working in, in one arm and the one arm capacity thing, it's giving me, um, things that are difficult for me to do. So something to work towards. And that's important. That's again, where that growth comes from. So yeah, like, uh, like I don't do crow pose hardly at all unless it's in a transition to something else because it doesn't, it's not serving me like it was when I first learned how to do it. Mm. And so it's, it's okay to like, you learn something and it gave you what you needed from it and to choose something else. Mm. So basically whenever I see you working out in the gym, you're always working towards the next step yeah. in the practice and I, maintaining. Yeah. I'm, I'm, well, yeah, I'm always work. It's not that I'm working towards the next step, but I'm always working towards challenge. Right. Uh, so like when I'm pulling the, the pulling exercises that I do, actually a lot of the exercises I do are, I, I do them cause they cross over into rock climbing cause I enjoy rock climbing and I want to be a better mm -hmm. rock climber so I could climb harder things cause it's fun. And, yeah, and yeah. like, it doesn't have to be more than that. It doesn't have to be like this deep philosophical reason of, Oh, you know, then I'm, then when I'm on the mountain, I'm in, touch with myself and nature and everything you know it's just i, I enjoy doing it and i want to be better at it for yeah. no other reason than that like you don't need to have a better reason than that i like doing handstands i want to be better at them mm -hmm. so i practice them you know if you like doing muscle ups and you want to be better at muscle ups you could practice doing it but it's always like what what are you what am i getting from it and so that's why i enjoy functional training and like the yoga i teach is functional training you know, I teach dragon pistol squats and in, in my yoga classes and sissy squats and all these different kind of ways to move the body because it's fun to move the body in unique ways. Like we are meant to be movers. Mm. The, the we are, we're definitely meant to be movers. And, and even as much as I move, I would say my life is still too sedentary. I'm still sitting on the couch too much. I'm still, you know, whatever, like not, not moving my body enough. So uh, I agree, man. Like I, I'm also of the same opinion. Like I, I mean, I, I don't have a three and a half hour practice. Well, I do jujitsu, which is like an hour and a half, and then I train as well three times a week in the gym. But um, yeah, I definitely can be moving more, even at the age of that I'm at now, thirty two. So yeah, and it for me, my whole like you could say it's trauma, I guess. But it's like I've been comparing myself my whole life to people, and so that's my my thing is like not comparing myself. So my language, even when I asked you, when I said, oh, people want to be like Dylan, that's my shit. That's not other people's stuff. That's like my comparison thing. So as I'm think, as I'm talking now, I'm thinking, I, I just need to improve where I'm at. Not not to be like Dylan, but just to improve my, my movement capacity. Yeah, so if you become the best in the world, then there's no one to be like. Mm. Okay. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's, that's kind of true. Uh, and some right. pe and some people, their goal is that like I need to be in the best, the best in the world, so that there's no one to I could compare myself to. But there's only one best in the world at any one thing. And how do you even know? You know, if you are the best, and most of that's subjective, anyways. There's there's eight billion people on the planet. Like the chance of you being the best at anything. You know, I'm not the best at yoga. I never will be. I don't care to be you don't, you don't gain anything from that other than, other than maybe 
yeah, I guess there's two ways to get rid of that needing to be like someone else or needing to like looking up to someone like I need to be like them is either to be better than them or just to realize that you don't need to be like them. And I think the, the latter is a lot more achievable for most people. Like, sure, if you are already at that place where you're almost the best, keep going, try to be the best. But I think when you're at that point too, you're not really comparing yourself to anybody else and it becomes more of a, like a personal challenge of how good can you be? Mm -hmm. And when I, when I became a yoga teacher, well, when becoming, when I, being a yoga teacher became my job, I had a desire to be the best yoga teacher that I could be. And it wasn't, and, and that's, I mean, that's subjective, obviously. Like there's a lot of people that don't like me as a teacher. Like I'm not everyone's teacher for sure. And if you like slow, soft, easy yoga, then I'm not your teacher and that's okay. Like I don't, I don't feel like I need to please anybody. Um, and so just based on that, how can I be the best yoga teacher if not everybody thinks I'm the best yoga teacher, but I want to be the best yoga teacher that I can be and, or at the best at anything that I can be. Like I want, I want to show up for myself in that capacity and it's just for me. Uh, and so when I, when I became a yoga teacher, I was like, I'm going to do everything I can to be the best yoga teacher that I can be. Mm. And it had nothing to do with anybody else. And, and that's, I think partly why I'm in this place. Also, I saw this movie called Jiro dreams of sushi and that really changed my perspective. Have you seen that movie? Yeah. Yep changed my perspective on, on things and it was it, it's like it's i think it, the if you haven't seen it i highly recommend seeing the movie it's just about this old dude that makes sushi but it really goes into japanese culture and this idea of just doing whatever it is like giving everything that you can to it and constantly striving to be better and it's something as simple as making sushi this guy's in his 80s i don't even know if he's still alive anymore yeah, but, I, mean, you, I don't know uh but just to put everything into mastering something, uh, whatever that is. And if, if what you're doing isn't worth mastering, then you shouldn't do it. And if you, if you're not trying to be, if you're not trying to be the best at that and then choose something that you want to dedicate your life to mm. this, is, this life is an experience and, and how I believe it is that it's like a one run thing, right? You just like, like you just, you, it's not a video game. You don't come back, right? I, I don't believe in an afterlife. Um, it's a belief, right? So I don't believe in that. I'm a, I would say I'm a humanist, which means that I, this experience is the one that we have and I want to give everything I have, I can to this experience because I have the opportunity for it. We, <laughs> If you look at, if you put things in perspective, going back to perspective again, and if we look at the universe, I mean, the universe is, it's unfathomable uh, how, how massive it is. And we have, and we are on this little blue rock with life. And not only life, but, but we are an organism that is self-aware conscious like however you want to define conscious and we're living an experience and in a time like where life is so comfortable and technologically advanced that it, it's it's crazy like the the chances the chances for life to exist in the universe much less you know to be experiencing that and so like i feel it's worth giving everything to that experience. Uh, and, and that's, you know, purpose is, purpose is what, what you make of it. Like you give life purpose other than, other than the universe's purpose of you just to, to pass on your genetic code, everything else is on you. And so like, how do you choose to show up in that? Mm. Yeah. So finding, finding something to master in this lifetime, because don't know when our days are not, days are up yeah. and just to dedicate our life to something. Yeah, my dad passed away this past September at 67, which oh, is sorry to hear that. pretty young, yeah. you know, and, and he went from you know, water skiing and, and snow skiing like every day, um, just very active and loving life to 
to dead. Um, from the time I found out that he was dying, he was given like a year or two. And I was teaching a teacher training and um, in Germany. And as soon as that was over, I, I flew home and he had 10 days. And it was like from from having a year to two two years. Well, then even then they told him he had he, he had a it he had bladder cancer that spread to his brain. And then um yeah, then they were like, well, you maybe have three or four months left by the time I got there. And it was it was ten days after I got there when he passed. And he yeah, it went so fast. And it's like you know, from one year yeah, we, we just we just don't know when when the end is going to be. Uh, so, you know, the, the the truth. If we, I like I like to talk to talk about truth a lot. There is really only one truth, and that's this moment. Everything else. So in, in yoga, they they think of truth as something that can't be changed, right? The the word for truth means sat, which means unchanging. And if everything is changing, everything in the universe is continuous changing, what is true? And the only thing that's true is this moment. And all life, all experience, everything is lived in this moment. And the only thing that you're guaranteed is this moment because the next moment, like, we don't know. And so you know, it's, it's, it's an opportunity, if anything. Life is an opportunity. It's, um, yeah, I, I feel very grateful and privileged to have this, and I don't want to squander that. And so, and I know at the end it, well, I don't know, but I imagine at the end it, it becomes a non-experience and there's no point to all of this anyways in the, in the vastness of time and space. But what does that matter? Because I'm here in this truth now. Right. So the only thing that's true is this present, the present moment. That's the only thing we can prove that's true. Uh, that takes me back to the Eckhart Tolle, the power of now. Mm -hmm. you know, that's all we all we have it's the present moment. Yeah, yeah, and this, he's definitely not originator of that. You right. know, yeah, yeah. That's like he's a he's another one of those teachers that took the wisdom of the sages. And I mean that that that's what a teacher does. A teacher takes something, takes an idea or something, and then digests it and presents it in a way that's easy to be consumed for someone else. It's how do we um, how do we compile knowledge and information and then pass it on it's not about inventing things i mean like some people do but when it comes to truth and ideas if it's true it's always been true if it's things change they they adapt as as times change as the needs of of humanity changes but still the the base of what that is is going to be timeless what what's it like to I, this is a deep question, but like, what's it like to live on knowing that you don't have a father now? What's that like for you? I have because I can't relate to that because my father's still alive. But yeah, how does uh, that affect you? It's it's a diff. It's weird. It's yeah, it's challenging. I I more see it. This is, life is definitely for the living, right? We um. So anything that comes from not having a father is, is, is all selfish. It's not about him not being here to experience anything anymore because he's now, he's now where we're all going to be. Uh, Louis C.K., he's a, quite a controversial comedian, but he started one of, his, the, one of his comedies talking about like, oh, everyone's here. Um, or like, thank you all for coming. But he's like, well, not all of you. Like, thank you, everyone. And this, you know, this isn't even everybody. Like, everybody's like, you know, whatever, seven point, whatever, how many billion people there are, but that's not even everybody. Like most people are dead. The, ma the majority of people that have ever lived, the vast majority of people that have ever lived are dead. Right? And we are mostly dead, right? The, if you look at what your life is, the majority of your existence is going to be like the vast majority is going to be dead. And so life, life is for just those that are living, but, and, like where, where I see it is I have these experiences or I do these things that I, you know, your, your parents are there to be proud of you. Like, and 
you know, as, as that's just like kind of something that's ingrained as you're growing up is you, you want your parents to be proud of you. You want to do stuff and like, and that do, never goes away. And so even as an adult, when you do something, you want to be like, I, I, I feel it most when I want to, I want them to be proud of me mm. and I want to be like, Hey, you know, I did this or check out this or, or whatever. And yeah. Um, so that's missing. I definitely, definitely miss that experience. Uh, yeah, and I miss, I, it's, it's more just I, I miss them. I miss talking mm -hmm. to them. I miss having that relationship. Um, yeah, it's like we all need, we all need cheerleaders in our life. That's a, it's a really important thing. It's what I teach my teachers is to surround yourself with, with cheerleaders. People... It sounds funny, but you, you want to be surrounded by people that lift you up, that tell you that you're doing a great job because it helps you to do better. When everyone says you're doing amazing, you want to do even more amazing. And that's what your parents, that's their number one job is to be your cheerleader, is to, is to be there and be like, you're awesome. Luckily, I have like 800,000 cheerleaders. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like, I feel like I, I, I lost that. Um, but it's, it's also, yeah, it's, it's just a strange feeling. Um, but after when, it, when he passed, like how I reacted to it was I, I, I went up into his bed and um, I just laid down in the, in the spot where he was. And I like just cried full out cried for like 10 minutes mm. by myself and then stopped and I was like, okay, um, I don't need to grieve anymore. Yeah. I don't need to grieve anymore. And I mean, it's still like I told myself that I still have like a bit of a grieving process, but I'm trying not to suffer from, from his loss, uh, and recognize the connection. Cause even though I don't believe uh, in spirits or the, the, whatever, like however you want to define the soul or whatever like that, uh, I still feel the presence of my dad in me. I, I, I still do. I'm 50% him. Anyways, my, my, my teacher, Mercy Ananda, she... Um, she told me the difference between love and attachment and, and really where suffering comes from is, is from separation, which is from attachment. You only have separation when you have attachment to something. And so when you lose somebody, what you immediately feel is that separation because of the attachment that you have to that person making you happy. And I really try to recognize that in myself, like how much uh, do I need him because he made me happy, right? Or, you know, he's my father and that, uh, and love is wanting them to be happy. And so when someone is gone that you just feel the connection really what's left. And that's after, after the separation fades because separation, attachment, separation are, are illusions that were separate again, perspective. Like you don't have to believe in this, but the, the philosophy for me works. So if you believe that we're all one and we're all connected, even though that we're different, that we can never lose each other. You know, we lose the, the vessel that, that is holding the personality, the ego, but what remains is the connection, this internal connection that we all have with each other. And so I try to feel that, focus on that. Um, and that definitely helps a lot with, with um, the loss, I guess from it. And I think, you know, from losing my, my father so young, uh, I think I've done okay. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the lessons that he taught me, even the, the ones that, you know, he taught me by not what not to do, which he taught me a lot of those. Mm. Yeah. You feel like now, now the lessons are coming back faster because he's not here. Do you feel like that somewhat sometimes? Like uh, you remember most of the things that he taught you that maybe while he was alive, you didn't really 
No, I think, I think, uh, I've been pretty aware of the things that he taught me yeah. and stuff. What I, what I n- notice more is like the similarities that we have. Uh, yeah, but it's like little things. Like if I ever do have a kid, like they're not going to have a grandfather and, and like that, I feel some, some sadness around. For sure. Yeah. But again, that's all, you know, people are selfish and I, and I, I feel that, that selfishness in me of wanting to have a dad, right? For that. Yeah. Um, but if I let go of that, I could just, uh, I could just feel, um, feel him and and the capacity where of of love and connection. I guess. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. This. Thanks for sharing, by the way. Yeah. Uh, that's really something that. You, you can't explain, but when you lose a parent, you, you feel it. Mm. Yeah. But I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's going to happen to everybody. Everyone dies. Mm. Life short. And 20 years is a short time. You know, give them another 20 years, but we want, we just, we always want more. Yeah. It's that never ending more, the more sin. I call it more syndrome. It's just that we want more always. Yeah. So you you have a book called The Illuminated Breath, right? Mm-hmm. And could you talk talk about the importance of breath? Because when when I first discovered breath work, I thought it was just to just release emotions. Like that's literally all I thought it was. But that's it's this way the the whole breath concept of controlling how, learning how to breathe is just that's step one, right? Yeah. It was. Well, it's it's pretty interesting because depending on where you're at, like uh, breath work. I was, uh, I have several friends here on the island that teach breath work and, and this emotional release or this holotropic breathing or conscious connection or rebirthing breath or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. It's basically based around hyperventilation. It's a very small sliver of the, of the, of understanding breath work and what that does. And, and the book is, is really what it does is it breaks down the physiology of breathing and, how that it relates to the emotional body um, and the different maps bringing in yoga as well. Cause what yoga does is it paints a lot of different, a lot of different maps or what a map, when I call it a map, it's just a basically a philosophy, mm-hmm. uh, a system of balance. Yep. And so we have a system of balance, which is called the autonomic nervous system that, that regulates our emotions. If you go a little bit deeper into the autonomic nervous system, you notice there's three parts of it. You have a sympathetic nervous system, uh, and then the parasympathetic nervous system breaks down into, into two parts, your ventral vagal and your dorsal vagal, which are just two different branches of the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10. And these, uh, how these nerves or how these, these systems, uh, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system operate affect us emotionally. So yoga maps those things out in different ways. Uh, the ones that I focused on in the book are the gunas, the values, and the nadis, which are just different systems of balance. One has to do with relationships to self and others and nature like so the values and how to navigate through that the other one has to do with the energies of nature and and like the gunas so I, I basically take these these four different systems and i show how they're related to the breath because if you, you um if you look at heart rhythm variability hrv the inhales connected to the sympathetic nervous system, the exhale is connected to the parasympathetic nervous system. If you balance the two, it balances the both systems there. Or if you're looking into the three part and balancing the two um, gives rise to the ventral vagal where if more of the exhale is going to be dorsal vagal. And then you see how these relate to the other system. So it's when you, the breath is, is a way to handle yourself emotionally and physically. Um, like I said, it's just as important as sleeping. It's just as important as exercise, as diet. If you have, if you have poor breathing, then you're not going to feel as good. You're not going to sleep as well. You're not going to eat as well. You're not going to digest as well. All these things because the breath directly affects your nervous system and your nervous system is responsible for all those things. Um, so that's, that's like a big part of the book is how to navigate through that, teaching people how to breathe. I mean, just like simple breathing through your nose or how much you should breathe and then how to take that and use that as a tool. 
Uh, so how to increase athletic performance, increase VO2 max, uh, vital capacity, how much air can you hold? How much oxygen can your body utilize? Uh, increase your CO2 tolerance, like all, all these different aspects that will make people a better athlete. Like that's a huge, huge part of it. And then how can you be more emotionally stable, more relaxed or, or calm? Or um, how can you have more energy? You know, if uh, the sympathetic nervous system has been demonized a bit because we think of it as a fight or flight system, and that's only half of it. It's only fight or flight when you feel unsafe. Uh, and a lot of people are in chronic sympathetic and chronic unsafe sympathetic through stress, right? So you get a lot of distress versus you stress, which is what you want. So you're in distress and then that's breaking down everything down to your, your DNA, but if you learn to use sympathetic nervous system in a good way, which happens through the breath and through your perspe perception of reality, then you could actually change how you energize and show up into you know, social engagement, interaction with people, play, mobilization, all these different things. And depending on where you are, where you want to be, you could navigate your attitude, your perception, your outlook at life and your energy based on how you change your breathing. And there's a lot of different practices for that. So the book works to break down those practices as well as address like what the, the, these ancient pranayamas, what they actually really do in the body on a physiological level, because it can be really confusing if you look into the ancient text of what one ancient pranayama practice does and it'll be like oh it does basically everything and then it'll be a little mystical as well and and i don't really find these for me anyways they might be for someone else but i don't find that as a useful tool when i really want to know how the breath affects me and so i break down those things so that you could actually take different pranayama practices and put them together much like how you would sequence a yoga class and and move it to be effective towards a specific goal so again not focusing on the tool but focusing on what that tool is used for mm. yeah wow so that's very useful for people because breathing is is something we do every day but most people don't think every about second yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. How many breaths do you take a day? I, I don't know the number, but I think it's like uh, it, 30, it, something. Yeah, like it's around there. It varies from person to person. I mean, some people breathe 10 times per minute. Some people breathe 20 times per minute. Yeah. Yeah. You know, breathing, breathing is like diet you know, or calories. If you're used to taking in a lot of calories, you need a lot of calories. And so you eat more. But if you get used to taking less calories and you're going to get used to that and you're going to eat less, breathing is the same way. If you breathe less, your body learns to breathe less. And this has to do with CO2 tolerance. That, uh, the amount of CO2 that you have in your body is gives you, uh, it's responsible for you breathing, like how the, your drive to breathe. It's um, your carbonic drive. So, which means that you're breathing based off of CO2 levels. So as the CO2 levels in your body rises, it tells you to take a breath. But if you get more tolerance to CO2, it means that you could breathe less. Higher and having more CO2 to the body is beneficial because it allows oxygen to go into the cells better. So it's one of the things that your body needs. You know, we have the pressure from the atmosphere as, as air comes into our lungs, it goes on to the red blood cells on the hemoglobin. So that's the that's what attracts it to to the things that carry the oxygen into the body. But for it to come off of the red blood cells, off of the hemoglobin and go into the cells, there has to be a mechanism to release that. And that mechanism is CO2. So the acidity of the blood and carbon dioxide. So only when that's present in the cells does it tell the oxygen to be released. So if you're over breathing, you're going to have less CO2, therefore less oxygen in the cells. Because as you exhale, you breathe off CO2. One of the reasons why this hyper this hyperventilation, which um, is really popular here, is is good for emotional release and stuff because it's just like doing psychedelics or any other kind of drugs like that. It uh, alters the mind and it connects new pathways and allows you to see things in a different way, which could be really beneficial for people. And it's actually developed um, by a, a person named Groff. It was originally the Groff method. And he was doing a lot of work with uh, psychedelics, uh, LSD and psilocybin. And then was made illegal, and so he couldn't do that. So then he started exploring breathing. Mm -hmm. The thing with the hyperventilation thing is, uh, it's really bad for you. Really? Like, yeah, physically, it's it's bad for you. Oh, interesting. But just like doing psilocybin's not good for you. You you oh. still, <laughs> yeah, you might ha do uh, yeah. some mushrooms and have a really amazing experience, but it's not something that you want to do all the time mm -hmm. because it's not healthy 
in a way. Uh, and the same thing, if you hyperventilate, you're over breathing, you're lowering your body's CO2 tolerance. When you hyperventilate, it causes vasoconstriction. And so less blood goes into the, less blood goes into the brain, less oxygen gets into the brain, which is what causes the hallucinations and all that stuff. Brain cells die, just like a night of heavy drinking or whatever. And then also the, the long-term effects, if you're practicing it regularly, um, then you increase or decrease your CO2 tolerance, which means that you are chronically going to start breathing more than what you normally would. It'd be like, think of about binge eating. Let's say if, if binge eating, if, if you binge eat and that allowed you to have a deep emotional release and out of body experience and this, uh, profound, um, emotional release or whatever, like, you'd be like, okay, that, that binge eating had, had, had this amazing effect on, on me, but you wouldn't want to binge eat every single day. Cause then you're just going to get fat and, and it's going to have physical effects on the, on the body. It's the same thing with all these different methods of the, of this hyperventilation for all of them. Even the ones that are, are gentle, if you're breathing more than what you should, you're hyperventilating. And that has a negative impact on the body physically. That's um, not to say it's not worth doing or that it's bad things have an effect. We, we choose whether or not those effects are good or bad based on, on what we choose or define as good or bad. If the need to do it for the emotional release or whatever, um, or whatever that's doing is greater than the, the physical impact that's having on the body, then you should continue to do it because it's doing the work that it needs to do. Uh, personally, I think it's a great practice, but I think it's one that should be done very seldomly. Like, once a year oh, kind of thing that, that rare once a year maybe once every six months but uh i think also when you do it a lot and i've, I've been doing holotropic breathing I was, I was first exposed to it in 2011 that was the first time i've done it and i've done it at least once every single year since then um so i have i have quite a experience bit of experience I also facilitated as well. Cause I do think it's a, it's a powerful practice, but it's one of the things that I notice with all these different trainings is they don't talk about the negative effects of it, of what it actually does. And that, that kind of does bother me a little bit because I feel like if you're teaching somebody to, you should be honest with somebody. I, I, I honestly think majority of the reason why it's not taught is because people don't know. Um, they, they just, it wasn't originally taught to them and they don't, they don't think about it, right? So it's it's a powerful practice. It's a beneficial practice, but it's also one that should be taken just like you would if you were doing LSD to uh, or psilocybin to have these like, or DMT or whatever, what you know, to have like some sort of psychological journey or release or whatever like that. And it, you should kind of view it as the same way as it, it's a powerful practice and it's not physically physiologically beneficial for the body mm. and it and if you're doing it every day it could lead to some very very serious uh side effects very serious like complications of the body from like hypertension high blood pressure um rapid heart rate i mean, you could get in get into um, negative, like poor sleeping patterns. And then just every, from there, everything just goes downhill to like killing your heart. And, and cause it's, it's, it's 100% sympathetic nervous system breathing, breathing fast. Yeah. Is, like that. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. That, like that, right? It, it, what varies it very, however, whatever, if even it's just like, <sighs> That is way so one full breath is 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 five liters five for like um a normal person holds anywhere from four and a half to six and a half liters like four and a half like it's more of a small woman six and a half is more of like a, a larger man you could increase that there's free divers that have like 11 liters that they could hold uh, as you expand your your vital capacity um uh, and you breathe about one tenth of that. So as a normal, what's called your tidal volume breath, like what you, you're normally breathing, which is about 0.5 liters. So if you're normally breathing 0.5 liters and you're breathing, you know, 10 times per minute, if you're super healthy, right, that's five liters, that's one full deep breath. So you're thinking that's if you like, it's, it's more like probably, you're probably breathing more around 15 times. So you know, it's like 75% it's of a breath, whatever. But, um, 
if you're breathing that that much full deep breath in and out, you're breathing 10 times the amount of air that you should per minute. And it's probably more than that, you know? So, uh, and in, in holotropic breathing, you are probably taking somewhere between 20 to 30 full deep breaths per minute. So you're, you're, I mean, the, the amount of air that you're moving in that is enough to incre- uh, create hypo, like severe hypocapnia where your, your carbon dioxide levels drop so low that blood, that you're no longer um, sending signals to the nervous system, which is why you get the, the carpal pedal spasms where the hands go like this <laughs> and the feet go like that. Those, those are extreme effects. Those are not good for the body. That's say, that's, that's the, the nervous system is actually not getting the signals from the brain and the, and the muscles are, are, are starting to tetany. They're starting to contract so much that they can't release. So there's, I mean, it's, it's not healthy. Mm. <laughs> so like, yeah. but, but there's people here teaching it that like you should do it every single day, right? Yeah. yeah, there's, or they're going through a course and they're doing it every single day or they're doing it once a week. And it's, um, it's probably too much, but like I said, you know, it's, I'm not, I'm not saying don't, or it's good or bad. I'm saying like, no, you should know what it's actually doing to the body. Know the information is the, the risk worth the reward is what you're getting out of it worth the negative health benefit the negative health not benefits negative health um uh repercussions whatever that that's that's happening so so your morning pranayama routine that you do so uh my my pranayama is based mostly around retention and increasing athletic performance so my my morning routine uh has to do with like expanding like lung uh lung expansion breath so increasing vital capacity how much air i could hold in my lungs how long i could hold my breath for i do hyperventilation every day um not to i do like through the nose all all my breath practices are through the nose but there's there's a lot of different reasons why you'd want to hyperventilate uh anytime i do hyperventilate it's always followed by breath retention so that way it's like, I guess you could say like, it's, if you, it's, <laughs> no, that's a really bad example, but I'll give it anyways. It's like eating a ton, ton of food and then throwing it up, <laughs> but, but it, it actually has a lot of benefit, uh, benefits to the body. So if you hyperventilate first and then hold your breath, you become hypocapnic. It's because remember I told you, like you take a breath based on how much carbon dioxide that you have in your blood. So if I breathe that off, those levels have to come back up until I want to hold my, uh, until I want to breathe again. So it allows me to hold my breath a lot longer. It's how uh, Wim Hof, which is uh, a yeah. tumo breathing. So you hyperventilate, then you exhale and you hold it at the bottom of your exhale. So your body has breathed off all that CO2. That's a much different practice. That's a practice you could do every day. That's because you are again, building your CO2 levels up, you're getting that retention back up. And so it's what you do with holotropic breathing or conscious connection breathing or rebirthing breath or any, any of those, they're all, in my opinion, I know people are going to say, Oh, they're so different. Yeah. But physiologically, they're all the same. Physiologically, they're all doing the same thing to the body as far as you're breathing faster than you should. And so but people still argue with me with that, but I don't, whatever. Um, no, it's not that. So I see the comments coming in right now. People want to defend something. If you feel like you need to defend it, ask yourself, why do you need to defend it? Like, I don't feel like I need to defend yoga or anything like that. It's like, if you need to defend it, there's a reason why. Because truth doesn't need to be defended. Mm. But anyway, so, um, yeah, when you when you hold your breath... So you're able to hold your breath a lot longer. And then what starts to happen is you now are working into apnea. You're holding your breath longer. So then your, your red, um, the oxygen in your blood, your, your blood saturation goes down as your blood saturation goes down. The first thing that happens is your spleen contracts and releases more red blood cells, oxygen, uh, saturated red blood cells into the system, uh, which gives you more red blood cells means you have a higher capacity for for your volume oxygen maximum whatever vo2 max to put more oxygen into the cells so that's increases athletic performance the other thing that happens is your your bone marrow which is where red blood cells are made starts to produce more um 
And this has a long lasting effect. You, you have like two and a half million red blood cells are made every second and two and a half million red blood cells die every second. So it's kind of like the turnover about that. But a red blood cell lasts about three or four months before it goes through through a cellular death. And so doing this kind of practice, you're, you're becoming more polycythemic, increasing the, the number of red blood cells. It's basically blood doping through breathing, increasing athletic performance. People do it with high altitude training, but you could do it through doing rapid breath and then holding your breath as long as you can. It also helps to increase your CO2 tolerance. So there's there is a lot of benefit through first hyperventilating, but always followed by really long breath holds. So the breath holds that I do is like, I'll do two minutes of hyper, like I'll go through rounds, but I'll do two minutes of hyperventilation. And then I finish with a, an exhale, hold my breath for three minutes and inhale, hold my breath for three minutes. So I hold my breath for six minutes off of two minutes of hyperventilating. So this is like, you know, it's like kind of my, my daily practice going through that. And that's the, the end round. And then I, so it's, it's always about breathing less than what you need to. And that when I work out, when I exercise, it's always breathing through my nose. I mean, that's like the most simple thing that you could do to increase your athletic performance through breathing is just make sure when you're doing jujitsu and you're working hard, breathe through your nose, like no matter what. It's tough. I, I know it's tough. <laughs> I, 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 I wrestled for, for a long time yeah. and I definitely didn't breathe through my nose, but if you, if you want to increase your strength, your performance, all that, learn how to breathe through your nose because you're actually getting more oxygen into the cells by doing that. And then also you're increasing your CO2 tolerance, which means that you get winded less. Being winded comes from having high levels of CO2, right? And so if you could tolerate more CO2, you're going to have more endurance and more stamina, uh, which is something that people don't really think about. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. no. Um, so there's a guy, Luke. Do you know Luke? He's a th the trainer at Soma. Uh, I'm not sure if you know him, but he was here on the podcast and he was talking about when he was after a fight, like after the first round, he would take three nasal breaths mm -hmm. and that would set him up for the next round. Like he noticed that if he didn't do that, then he would he would be gassed out. Yeah, just the three deep nasal breaths at the end of each round helped him perform better. It's yeah. interesting. So what I do when I, when I teach people like recovery breathing, like when you're gassed, even in my yoga classes, after I go through like a really hard fast, I, I do like burpees and stuff in my yoga classes. Like I'm <laughs> so unconventional, but after that, then I, I make people breathe slow and hold their breath. And so like when I get gassed, the, my, my natural response to like feeling like <sighs> is to and hold my breath as long as I can and then slowly exhale and do it again and just work on, on retaining as, as much as I can. And that actually brings more oxygen in the cells. But what makes you want to breathe is not being low on oxygen, it's being high on CO2. Mm. So as you increase your CO2 tolerance, you get winded less, your endurance goes a lot more. I'm yeah. going to try that when I next exercise. You can do that anytime you exercise, right? Anytime, yeah. All, you should do it always when you exercise or when you train jiu-jitsu or anything. You should always breathe through your nose. Yeah, it, and it'll... It's, it's training as well. So it's difficult to do in the beginning. Yeah, if you, a good way to start trying to do it is to start practicing sprints and then um, breathing through your nose during your sprints. And then when you finished, finished sprinting, then work on retention mm. to increase your CO2 tolerance. Do you ever put the tape across your mouth as well? Or you don't need to do that? No, I don't need to do that. But um, in, in my teacher trainings, I, I, I tape their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. So um, there's only one other thing I want to talk to you about, which which is um, meditation. Okay. Um, because that's such an interesting topic to me and everyone has their own, again, everything's subjective, right? So mm -hmm. your definition of meditation would be different to mine. Um, but I know you've been meditating for a lot, a number of years now, of course, with the yoga practice, it's like included, it's included in the package, right? Yeah. So how, how does that help you in terms of your emotional state? Like, for example, when you get triggered from something in your life and then you go ahead and do your practice, do you feel like meditation really helps you move through those emotions or feel more? Cause you know, like when people do psych psychedelics and the breath work, it's all to kind of not a lot of time, a lot of times it's kind of to release the emotion mm -hmm. that they, they can't access by themselves. So they need this external thing to help them. So do you feel like meditation does that for you or how do you? Uh, I, I would it? say like I rarely get triggered by anything. Uh, and I would, uh, I would um, credit that to meditation. So meditation, 
the way that I, I view meditation, there's, there's, you could argue that there's two paths of, of meditation, uh, vipassana or vipassana, which is insight, mm -hmm. and then shamatha or samita, depending on who you talk to or how you pronounce it, which means um, tranquility. And they're both basically along the same path of why you meditate. So one, one is to meditate to feel good and calm and relax, like doing transcendental meditation or visualization meditation or something like that. The other one is to actually understand yourself, your tr the, the truth and the tendencies of the mind. So how the mind wanders, how, where it goes to, how it fluctuates. And so my meditation practice is really, it's about, first of all, it's like setting up, recognizing where my distractions are gonna come from for that day. So that's the first part of my practice is, um, I'm trying to give like useful things for meditation rather than just talk about whatever. But uh, so when I sit down and meditate, I think about what are the things on my mind? What are the things on my heart? What are the things I think are gonna come up during my meditation? And I, I call those distractions. So then I sit down. Uh, set up my seat, my, my practice, how long I'm going to do it for. And I, I focus on the breath. There's a lot of different ways that you could focus on the breath. You focus. So uh, I used to teach like focus on the breath at the, the, the tip of the nose, which is kind of how I've been taught a lot, like that one pointed centerness or um, at the belly. But now I just focus on, on the breathing part of it. And it's, the, the whole reason why you have a meditation object, the meditation object could be anything, but it should be something that's fairly benign and, and boring, like the breath, which is something that we do always. It's, it's automatic. You don't need to think about it. You can, you can control it, though, if you do think about it. But the, the mind is always going to want to go to whatever is most interesting. And the breath is not interesting. And so the mind wants to go to something else. And so you're training the mind to not do that, to not, it's like training a dog. Like if you have a dog and you train it to sit, it'll, it'll, it'll sit. Or if you, if you have an untrained puppy or whatever, it's going to go all over the place. And so you continue to, to train it to sit for longer and longer and longer and it becomes more behaved. Well, the mind, you know, you've heard like, you're not your mind, mm -hmm. but you also can't control your mind, but you could train your mind just mm -hmm. like you could, you can't control a dog, but you could train a dog. And the way that you train the mind is by rewarding it, by telling it, good job. So my distractions or whatever else is coming up in my mind, I sit down and I close my eyes and I focus on my breath. And then as things come up, whatever, I, I recognize that they come up. So I, I count, inhale, one, exhale. Inhale, two, exhale. Inhale, three, exhale. Thought. So a thought comes up and then my goal in, in that is to recognize that thought as quickly as possible. What is that thought? Not to judge it, not to whatever, by going through the distractions first, those are less likely to come up. But if they do come up, then it's like, maybe I need to think about that a little bit more after my meditation or why is that such an important thing or, or whatever. But generally once I, I think about my distractions for some reason, they don't come up. So something else comes up and I, I, Okay, is this a future thing, future thoughts? Is this a story? Is this a past memory? Like, am I creating shit? Is this, am I remembering shit, basically? And then I let that thought go, and then I go back to one. When I get to one, I'm like, good job. I, I, I literally tell myself good job in my mind, which just sounds kind of silly, but give myself that reward. If I get to 10, I go back to one. I say, good job. And so the goal then in the counting of the breath is always to get to back to one. Um, and you do that either by not losing focus or recognizing that you lost focus. It's, and it's more important to recognize that you lost focus than it is to get to 10. You just, as you train meditation, you get to 10 more. Uh, and through that process, you start to understand where your mind is going. Where, where does it, you know, it's like, what is it attracted to and what is it uh, averse to? And, and these are important things. Anytime we're moving, whether it's the mind or the body, we're either moving towards something or moving away from something. And recognizing those two different types of movements helps you understand who you are a lot better. And, and that comes down through honesty of, of like actually honest, honestly, like what is my mind going to all the time? Is it, is it, I close my eyes and immediately goes to sex, right? Or I close my eyes and immediately goes to money or, or whatever, you know, you know what I mean? Or to, to drama, like relationships, fights or something, you know, um, 
or just to stories that I'm making up out of thin air. And so that will, will help train you and understand who you are better. And, and that way, when other things come up, you aren't triggered as much, right? Because you start to realize that the, the, the truth of the situation, which is, is people are just doing things because of themselves and not because of you. And so it's really hard to be triggered. There's, there's a story that I probably have mentioned in almost every podcast I ever, ever talked about. And you said, we're going to talk about books later or whatever. You're going to ask my favorite book. One of, one of my favorite books is probably because of this, it's, it's a Buddhist book. Uh, I'm not a Buddhist, by the way. I'm just, <laughs> I, uh, I just like some of the philosophy it really makes sense to me. Um, but the, the book is called Being Nobody, Going Nowhere. I am Kema. Uh, she's, she was a Buddhist monk. Um, anyways, there's a story of a boat floating down and it's, um, the boat you're, you're, you're in a boat and you see another boat coming and it, and the boat smashes into you and you look up and you see that person and your boat capsizes, you get in the water and then you're just all upset and like you're a victim to that. And then, um, so you have, so you're angry, you feel, you feel like someone did something wrong to you. Uh, and then that same situation or another situation, maybe you're, you're still rowing down the boat and you see another boat coming, but this time it's empty. It crashes into you, you capsize, you get wet and, and you get out and there's nothing to be angry about. You're just wet. And so what's the problem? You're just going to dry, whatever your boat's broken. So what's the problem? You're just going to fix your boat. And when you, when you start to realize that everybody, that it's all just empty boats, that things happen to you because of people are doing things based on how they feel, then you become less reactive and you start to become more forgiving and understanding and seeing people from there. Why did this person lash out at me? Why did they hurt me? One of those things may be because you're an asshole and you deserve it, in which case you, know, you should apologize and, and, you know, work on yourself. Uh, but if, if you come to the conclusion that you, it wasn't deserved, then it didn't have anything to do with you. Um, which, so that makes it, it's really hard to be triggered if it wasn't about you. Uh, and so like, I think as you meditate and that as you start to understand yourself better and you start to become less reactive and you start to see the, the, the world more exactly as it is rather than how you're seeing it, then, um, it's a lot easier to navigate in, in a truthful and honest way and be less affected by other people's actions and, and be a better person and also suffer a lot less. Yeah, and I have definitely experienced that myself since I started meditating, just become a lot calmer. Like yeah. things don't really trigger you that much when you, well, you, I think it's, I don't think it's just meditation. I think it's like coupled with the practice too, like with a physical challenging practice. It's just like the, I don't know how you feel about it, but the anger, sometimes if you have anger, like for me, for example, sometimes I have anger and I do jujitsu and then afterwards I'm just, I'm just zenned out on the floor, you know? And I think through the physical exertion, I'm able to work through those emotions. Yeah. I mean, that makes tons of sense. And especially if you think about physiologically through the sympathetic nervous system, you're getting all the energy out. And so you don't have any of that energy left to, to dedicate to being angry. And you're exhausted from, from that. So you have to go into the recovery state in yoga. It's uh, this, this is this, the cycle of the gunas. So there's three different gunas and they represent different energies of, of, or they represent how energy is manifested in the universe. So the first one is Rajas, which is the passion. That's the sympathetic nervous system. That's getting angry. That's also, that's also doing work and, and whatever, like, um, but it, the way that energy moves is it expands outwards and it continues to expand until it becomes exhausted. You think of like a, a dense puff of smoke as it, dis, as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it dissipates. And that's kind of like how our Rajas energy works. Like it's, it's strong in the beginning, but the, the, the longer that it lasts, the weaker that it gets. And so if you exhaust that through movement and stuff, then there's not a lot left. But then Rajas is always going to, oh, Rajas is then going to move into Tamas, which is, Tamas is the energy of like calming, relaxing, grounding, being at home. It's also the energy of death and dying as well, uh, decay. But Tamas, it's, it's the way that energy moves is it consolidates and grounds. And so that's our recovery phase. And we always move from, from Rajas into Tamas, from 
uh, and and balance you're not going to exhaustion you're you're moving through it so you're moving from exercise or whatever activity into rest and then between those two phases is sattva which is which is balance that's um its energy is ascension but as as when things are in balance we ha- we move towards growth so ascension growth but the, the growth that it's talking about is spiritual growth and so that's why it's you know when you when you're thinking about moving into spiritual growth with rajas you have your physical energy the exertion the jujitsu or whatever getting all that out tamas you have meditation uh grounding consolidated coming to that and when those two are in balance then it arises for that that middle energy of sattva which leads to your spiritual growth and so I, I that's why i think it's so important to have the balance of those two practices if you want to grow uh, as a person Mm, absolutely and for anyone listening that's like very insightful for them to hear you know like the connections between those yeah so um i was going to ask you because i'm just very curious like what was the biggest uh, obstacle that you've had to overcome in your career thus far probably trying to prove myself and the, the, the obstacle is just me Right, it hasn't been through anything else. But I mean, I, I'm sure I could think of examples of where I could put someone else in that. But I think my biggest obstacle was trying to prove that I was worthy enough to be a yoga teacher, or I was worthy enough to share what I had out there. Um, you know, that whole imposter syndrome that everybody has, especially when you're put in the limelight and into that. You know, like why me? Like I don't, I'm not, I don't deserve this. Um, there's people out that are better qualified that are smarter that are better movers whatever you know and yeah that was i i had that forever it's like just never felt good enough you know which came from my childhood it came from from having an abusive stepmother that i wanted to love me and trying to do things to, to be like hey like i'm good enough for you to love me and mm-hmm. never never receiving that uh to spending nine days out in sweden uh on a on a solo nature quest where i was just alone in the forest naked meditating for like 12 hours a day or or longer probably probably longer than that by myself and and where i came to the realization that it wasn't about me and i had nothing to prove but it was like i was always trying to prove things to other people but I, i had the realization like i don't need to prove it to myself and and once I stopped needing to prove it to myself, I didn't need to prove it to anybody else. And then it, then it wasn't about me, and my teaching wasn't about me, and being the best yoga teacher that I could be wasn't about me. It was just about about playing the role or doing the service or doing the work and letting go of all those needs to be good. And then once I let go of the need to be good, I, I think I was when I was able to to really fall into that role that I always wanted to be in. That's very interesting. So you said that you needed to be good. So my mind's going like, did, were you enjoying yoga up before before that? Like when you uh, had that need to be good, were you enjoying yoga? So when I w- set off on that vision quest, like all these things were going on in me, um, but I didn't recognize them so much. Right? These are these are things coming up from childhood. This this need to prove yep. that to prove to other people. Uh, when I went into like I, the, f- the first day of sitting, it was like, why am I suffering? My life is so amazing here. Like hundreds of thousands of people like show me like adoration and like I'm doing what I love, like absolutely love my job. I'm, I'm I have time, resources, uh, you know, freedom, like, uh, and also like purpose like why i felt like i put myself in a place of suffering and i did but it, again like it was the suffering that that came from my pers- my perception my of of my reality i was in this beautiful forest and 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 sweden and just instead of like looking and being grateful for that i was like i i need distraction i need something and and the first thing i was doing was looking at myself and i didn't like what i saw uh even though i'd been meditating for a long time before that it was it was like through that situation where i didn't have a phone i didn't have pen and paper i didn't have anything but like a sleeping bag a tent and very very little food um not even i didn't even have a 
wasn't even doing a movement practice when I was out there or anything. It was, it was all about no distractions uh, and just extreme levels of boredom. My, my, one of my teachers, Shane Christopher Perkins, uh, he told me that boredom is us thinking that things should be different than what it is. And so, you know, that, that boredom set in because, you know, here I am used to having all this stimulation all the time. And it was like, why do I think things should be different than that, what they are? Why, what is my aversion to this truth? Because how they things are is the truth. And why are we averted to truth? Why do we want something different? And that's what boredom is. And so, uh, yeah, so I started doing the work and, and looking within. And then as soon as I, as soon as I came to that realization, I didn't need anything anymore. Uh, and it was like I put down a weight that I had been carrying for 35 years. So. Well, that's um, very profound. I think um, a lot of people can get a lot from that, like myself included, you know? Yeah. Like it's, it feels exhausting to have that, uh, that need to be fulfilled, you know, like that yeah. need to be good to prove, even like you said, proving something to yourself. Like I view myself like that. Like I don't need my dad to, I don't need to prove anything to my father or my mother, my brother, but I need to prove something to myself. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, it was like proving that to my stepmother when I was, when I was a kid. Right. Um, and I, I didn't recognize that, that it was, that was still there. And I didn't re realize that I needed to, I like, I'm pretty good at things. And I think I'm pretty good at things because I felt like I needed to be good at things so that people would like me. Mm. And so right. like, I, I need to be great at all these sports and, and whatever. Cause if I'm not, then what are people going to like me for? Mm. And, and, and like anybody listening to that, you, you, that, that should sound like a fallacy. That should sound like ridiculous. Like why would, of course, people don't love you because you're good at something, but why do we tell ourselves that? Um, yeah. So I went from like almost instantly from being like the biggest people pleaser to like, I don't care. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and it was, it was so free to not to be like, I, it's okay if you don't like me. Yep. Yeah. I don't even need to like me. That's not, it's not even important for that. <laughs> that's, a, you know? that's an interesting concept. <laughs> yeah. I don't need to like me. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm not, uh, by saying that doesn't, I'm not implying the opposite that right. I don't like me, but that the fact that, that that's, it's not important. Like mm. that's uh, like, I love myself, but it's not important for me to love myself because I don't, I don't crave that. I don't need that. It's not, I'm, I'm already complete. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So I guess the work is just believing that, but having that belief that I'm yeah. already complete, like that I'm enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And what is this other than beliefs, like this experience? Mm. Yeah. So that segues into my last question, which I ask every single guest is what is the meaning of life? I, I, I think the best way to answer the meaning of life is is, is really to take away everything. So instead of thinking of what life is and what we could add to it, but you, you take away everything until, n until nothing remains. Mm -hmm. And then it's there. And then there's truth. Yeah. And then there's truth. I, and I, I mean, that's one way to say it. Another way to say it is it's meaning the, the, the easy answer, the usable answer that's less profound it's probably just whatever whatever you decide it to be. Mm. Are, are the only truth that we know is subjective truth, meaning the only truth that you know is the one that you've directly experienced, and no one else knows that truth but you. Yeah. And so your purpose comes from, from you wanting to give, or your meaning comes from like purpose or whatever. Like life is your your experience of life is yours and so your meaning of life is yours your purpose of life is yours mm. and it's unique to you and it's also created by you mm, absolutely and I, I i agree with that like I'm, i have a similar philosophy of the way i view life and it's all subjective but there are some things that are similar you know 
how we view the world. But I appreciate you coming on here and sharing. Yeah, thanks for having yeah, me. It's like good chat and it's good to get to know you more as well. Same, same. Yeah. Uh, so where can people find out more about you if they're, they're listening to this? Uh, my website, DylanWarnerYoga.com, Instagram, DylanWarnerYoga. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. I'll link you up in the notes. And uh, okay. Dylan, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Catch you guys on the next one. <laughs>